Thanks, Visa. Um, hi, everyone. I see some familiar faces as well from other, even other parts of the internet that I frequent. <laughs> mm -hmm. Awesome. So 18 people. Cool. Uh, yeah, it's been an absolutely crazy ride, you guys. Uh, the past few weeks, um, it felt like coming out of my internet cave where I just tinker and smash rocks together with a few, you know, friends to sort of emerging into the bright light of the mainstream media <laughs> and uh, trying to convey this rather complex idea that I think is well, well beyond what the mainstream media usually kind of is able to digest, which is a second brain and personal knowledge management and extended cognition. But I'm having a blast. I'm having so much fun just stumbling around, making mistakes, having successes alike. Uh, and I'm just happy to be here. It's not common I get to spend this much time with such a small group kind of diving into either second brain stuff or especially personal growth stuff. Uh, and I know the II community is one of the most thoughtful and most reflective out there. So I'm excited. Nice. Yeah, I remember. Give me a second. My cat just came. <laughs> Hold on. Amazing timing for my cat. Anyway, uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, it's been very, very cool to witness uh, how you've been working through your book, how you've been doing marketing, having conversations with people about their challenges. And the last shared thing we did was massive with like tons and tons of people. And it was, it was still, I would say for such a large crowd, it was still fairly intimate. Like people, you know, we were talking about emotions and feelings. And I think that's the... The interesting thing that I've seen recur in our conversations and just in this space that like, uh, you know, it, I, I think there's this mainstream assumption that the things around the productivity GTD space is very technical, very, um, you know, kind of, how would, you, how would you put it? Like instrumental, right? Very procedural. It sounds clinical and cool. But when we actually dig into it, it's like, oh my God, everything is about feelings. Everything's about, you know, emotions and what's what's blocking you. And yeah, you know, it's it's just where, where, tell me about what that has been like for you, like coming around. I mean, I know you talk about it in your book, but let's just like re review that. Yeah, I think um, Basil might need his microphone muted. I don't know if someone can do that. <laughs> uh, I'll do it. Uh, who is not muted? Cool. I think it's cool. it's done. Yeah, yeah. man. Uh, gosh. So let's see. There's an interesting kind of connection here. Like, I think a lot of people would ask, what in the world is a second brain, this mechanistic, mechanical, productivity, systems, tech-oriented thing have to do with the, you know, the world of subconscious emotions and, you know, trauma, which is one of the other main themes that I write about. Uh, I, I see them as so related. And I'm trying to think how to, how to enter the subject. I mean, one, one way to think about it, like kind of the broadest way, uh, is to talk about mainstream culture. <clears throat> in a way, the past three years, the, the main subject that I've been thinking about and studying is how mainstream culture works, right? Like, like the, the actual content of a second brain had to be kind of locked in when I started this process a few years ago. But then I had to kind of consciously basically say, okay, instead of diving down internet rabbit holes and reading ever more obscure things on, you know, post-rationalist blogs, I need to actually do, do really weird things like read bestsellers, <laughs> you know, like what is, what is on the news? What is Oprah talking about? What is, you know, on the Tim Ferriss podcast, like how exactly do new ideas enter that what's called the Overton window and go from this tiny little niche to the mainstream? Like that's been my, my thing. And I, I noticed kind of speaking to this, the, the, the framing of this salon, uh, something happened during COVID you guys that I don't think we've yet realized. I think that when COVID happened, the achievement, the, the whole era of like hyper achievement ended. I have a tweet storm mm -hmm. about this. The achievement era ended. It's almost like in late 2019 was like the gilded age. Everyone was on Instagram with their Ferraris. Everyone was renting out private jets for 
an hour so that they could get their Instagram photos. People were, you know, jetting to Europe for a weekend, like all these such excessive amounts of consumption. COVID hit. And I, with everything I was paying attention to, I felt the, the culture change, but especially the self-improvement culture, the, the, the self-help publishing industry went through a sea change. Um, and as I was writing my manuscript, I actually had to change what I was writing. And one of the things I changed was the paragraph that, you know, I, I put in the description, which was, I just realized I cannot frame this book as just achieve, reach your goals, climb the mountain, smash and break through. Like that was not going to resonate anymore in a post-COVID world where it's now about self-love, self-understanding, mental health, work-life balance, all those things that had been kind of under the surface have now been kind of launched into the, into the central conversation. So um, that's kind of how I see like a second brain is now a system you can optimize outside of yourself so that you don't have to be optimized because I think that's, what's falling out of fashion is this idea of the, you know, the protean Olympian human that is optimized in all, on all levels, on all aspects. I think that's, that's quickly falling out of fashion. That's so interesting. Yeah, I think you're right. You're totally right. Right. And uh it's and the cool thing is I, I think we know people who have been thinking around this space, writing around this space for you know 10, 15 years. And there were always, you know, I, I would say there were always the these the questions. So you know, I don't want to do a disservice. I think that's the thing that sometimes happens where people throw the previous um like paradigm under the bus as though like nobody in the in, like seven years ago was even thinking about emotions or whatever like if you go and dig into the old stuff they, they do bring it up but i think you're totally right that the the broader culture so it's, it's, it's interesting that like you mentioned mainstream culture yeah like the broader culture of hustle and grind and like it feels like the promise of that in in the wider sense is no longer currently um just uh, uh, it doesn't seem as achievable and it doesn't even seem like achieving it is desirable i think that's the that's the interesting thing so they're like it, you can almost see there are some like uh you know like instagram hustle and grind celebrity types where they don't quite know they, they've succeeded at what they were trying to do and then it's like but the audience has changed around them and it's, I've, i feel for them because it's, it's so tricky when you've optimized your life a certain way and you've kind of uh, built that up and but I guess I guess that's the interesting uh, creative challenge, even and creative in the fullest sense, right? Like really going back to the roots of what this, what are you creating? Who, what, what is the experience you're making? You know, if you have an audience, what is your relationship with that audience, and and how are you coming to show up for them, and how are you inviting them to show up back for you? And yeah. and that is very interesting to cycle through. Yeah, it's anybody. It's, I mean, there's a funny way you can just kind of step like step back from it and just see that it's a, just a pendulum. I'm reading this book right now. I think it's called Sacred Rights. Let me confirm that. Like R-I-T-E-S? Yeah, let's see. Oh, I don't have it on my computer. I believe it's called Sacred Rights, which is just basically, it's like the history and evolution of religion in the United States, mm -hmm. but treating everything as a religion like completely mm. collapsing the distinction between traditional religions and new religions. And you just, right. I mean, she goes back hundreds of years, just a few decades, you know, in the past, it was like, perfect yourself in the eyes of God, mm. right? Like live the most holy, pure, virtuous life. At some point it became secular, but it doesn't matter. This is a bigger trend than the trend of religiosity declining. And she actually even challenges the idea that religiosity is declining, but we just go every few decades. Okay. Love yourself make yourself better love yourself make yourself better it's just this clock <laughs> right and it, and it, I, I think it makes sense from a perspective of the limitations of language right so like again the most enlightened people in either quote unquote camp they would be aware of the trade-offs that are being made and not to be too extreme in either direction yeah. but when you have messaging that is short and pithy and gets transmitted across uh, a large crowd like it always it becomes simple slogans and be like you know work harder you know or yeah. you know stop working so much or whatever and 
it, it is tricky. I, I'm curious how you dealt with that when you were working on the book even because so like I was writing my own it's not a book but it's like a large writing project and the challenge I felt was that even with a large writing project you're trying to convey it's almost like you have a sprawling city worth of information right in every context every so many different things from so many different angles and when you write a book you have to basically kind of take your readers on a tour through the city and it's like it's an impossible task. You can't actually, you know, share your love for your city that you've built over decades or many, many years and then transmit it in like one day's tour or like one reading session. And I'm very, very curious to hear from you like how you dealt with that challenge. Does, that, does the question make sense? <laughs> it does. I just, uh, <clears throat> I'm working on a, a blog post uh, called The Psychological Toll of Writing a Book. Ha, I, because, yeah, I'm already subscribed. <laughs> <laughs> I've never, I've never seen an author write about this. You always hear, oh, the launch went great, and here's all the accolades, the awards, the bestsellers, all the good side. I've always been curious about, well, what did this cost? Mm. What was the trade-off here? What was sacrificed in order to achieve this? You know, writing a book is this is really like the intellectual Mount Everest. It is yeah. the intellect in the intellectual world, the equivalent of okay, you climbed the highest mountain. Um, and I, it's a long post. I'll just, I'll, I'll put it, put it that way. Um, so much, I mean, so much sleep foregone. Um, the thing that most pains me, I think is the times where I wanted to just hang out with my family. I was just talking last, last night. In fact, my wife and I did a little, did a little ritual that my, my coach suggested where we basically like grieve this period of our lives. Um, we kind of each like said and, and apologized for back and forth, apologized for what we missed, what didn't happen, the expectations that were not met, the regrets, because it's like, as you know, the, the energy that you have to put into it is so inhuman. It's more than one human can put in. So I feel like I was almost like a character in like a sci-fi, like a hive mind where I was just sucking in energy from my wife and my wife's family who spent so much time watching, you know, our son to my family, to my friends. It's like, I was this like vortex of energy pulling from all these people in order to get this thing done. And that was painful. It was really, really hard, really, really hard because once you're, it's like a train, once you're on the train and you have all these deadlines and milestones, there's so many people involved. You can't slow it down. Like the, at, at least the traditional publishing approach that I was taking, right. dozens of people at any given time were working on, you know, different aspects. I can't be like, oh, you know, I'm just I'm a little stressed guys. Like, in fact, I probably could have, this is probably a limiting belief, but I felt that I, I was not able to even slow down or even pause for, you know, a couple of, the, the whole project was three and a half years, but the last like year and a half or two years was the most intense. Wow. Yeah, you know, and to kind of give you, so my, my path was a very self-published, self-author, DIY, nobody, I'm not answerable to anybody kind of thing. But even then, I felt like I was, so like there were not as many people directly involved and like nobody's, it wasn't anybody's job to be directly involved. But I felt, and I felt all the more that if I'm going to do this by myself, like I, I owe myself some obligation. And again, this is also like probably my limiting belief, which is like, I just have this this ideal vision that I'm trying to strive for. And I remember once, uh, I think I was talking to Connor actually about this, and we were talking about um, perfectionism and creativity and like, and in the context of, you know, I was thinking about this book that I was hoping to be done in a year or so, and it took me three plus years. And he was thinking about it in terms of running a software company. And it's just like, there really comes this point where, and like you said, you, you face the, sacrifices that you've made so far and again even just saying this out loud it sounds noble or pretty or something and it's not it's like it's just miserable right it's just you, you and even if you know that the book is good and so now like several months after publishing i can look back and be like oh that was a good book i received feedback from readers and they're like oh this is helpful to me thank you so much for writing this i'm like yeah that feels good but in the final six months or so i and i was like losing sleep and i was uh you know, just just not run like kind of in a in a fugue state, right? Like yes. there's just nothing else on my mind but my book. I'm I'm second guessing everything, and 
uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have like a clever end to this. I'm just kind of agreeing with you that the process is like a crazy vortex thing. And, you know, it's, I'm, I'm glad that once it's done, if, you know, if you planned it properly well enough from the start, and again, like when you start planning halfway through, you find that it's totally different than you expected. But like, if you manage to come out of it with a good book or a product or whatever, like at least you can tell yourself that the sacrifice was was worth something. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I I feel like every creative that I have a conversation with, like there is some some part of that. Like there's this despairing element. And then you know you sit back afterwards and be like, was there a healthier way to do the whole thing? Yeah. Like me, me, right? Do, do you feel that? Do you look back and you're like, hmm. And yeah, I do. I have this uh this little group of five basically friends who are are either writing books or writing proposals or thinking of writing books. And, I, and we're in a little WhatsApp group and I'm just trying to like share the mistakes that I made in different things. I think, yeah, definitely made mistakes. One of them was looking back when they said manuscript deadline as a independent blogger, like the deadline or the, the, the public, you know, the, the moment you submit the writing, it's, it's finished. You just put it on the blog and then you hit publish and it's published. Right. Looking back, that was just the first of multiple deadlines. Like I realize mm-hmm. now they, they they must have authors that just turn in absolute crap, right? That is just like <laughs> right, all right, over the right. place. And then the author right. needs to be moved through all these stages. My first right. manuscript was like ready to be printed. <laughs> right. I get it. Yeah. That, that created more stress than I think was necessary. I, I, I basically compressed the time, the work into too small of a time than I had to. Mm. Yeah, there's, there's all this project management skill that you develop on working on the largest project of your life in some sense right like so like a several hundred page book like what what struck me was how much when i'm when i used to blog and stuff i kind of rely on oh i type out the blog post i can scroll back and forth and get a sense of the whole blog post and i can edit it on the fly you can't do that with a book because when it's hundreds of pages you can't even conceive of the book in one session so you have to like partition it in all these strange ways right yeah, everyone's always like, why did it take so long to write that? Because the end result is very simple. Right. It's like a sixth yeah. grade reading level. Why was this so hard? But it's like, you know, that your editor will say things like, my editor would say, the language is a bit too inspirational. Just dial it a little bit more practical. Like the whole book. And I'm just like, <laughs> like, how... How do you even, that's not just like, oh, change this word on this one page. It's like right. change the entire tone slightly in h- dozens, hundreds of small, subtle ways that probably no one will explicitly notice, but that the gestalt will right. appeal to a slightly different audience that we think is better. Oh my God. It's just. <laughs> yeah, that I, I'm, I'm amazed that you managed to to do that. So like that's for, for me, I think that's, I, I think I would I mean, go crazy like to, to deal with that. But, you know, reading the book so far, I, I, and I feel like your voice really does come through. Like, and that's the, that's another mystery thing about writing, right? Like um, when you re-edit and revisit and like kind of, you know, when you crunch the paragraphs down into individual sentences and words, and then it starts to not, it, it starts to all kind of get fuzzy. And then you're like, is this me? Is this, are these words, do they make sense? And it's just, that was my process. And, but then you, you, eventually you need some distance from the material, right? So that you can, it's like semantic satiation, but at a larger scale. Like, so, so that, that semantic satiation is when you repeat the same word over and over again, and then it sounds like it's not a word. And the same, yeah. I, I found that the same thing was true for my whole book. Okay. I want to bring this back to like the, the, the theme of today's discussion, which is like, so, which is about, you know, um, going beyond self-improvement and you know i i feel that la- so I, I brought up the book in part because i'm curious because i'm also an author but like also just in thinking about large projects that are very consuming right like that really suck you in and and you know i think there's this there's this um mental image some people have of the idea of self-improvement or whatever where it's kind of it's kind of cute. It's kind of piecemeal, like tinkering with with a thing, like just doing little hobbies and projects or like something on the weekend. And I mean, I'm not saying those things don't work, but like in practice, when you talk to people about what they're struggling with, it's like, oh, you know, my, my marriage is on the rocks or oh, my, my, job, my career is something and oh, this massive project that I'm working on is not working out. And uh, I'm curious about, so I haven't, I don't think I've ever specifically asked you about 
you know, when, when you have talked to your, you know, community people and your users and readers and, and all those folks, like what, what sense have you gotten from, from that sphere of personal, where the personal life intersects with the personal improvement? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really love this, this topic. Um, so a couple of things, I think there's a similar, uh, culture change happening in the self-improvement world. Uh, it's, it's from my point of view, very clear the, the kind of the first generation of secular self-improvers, which started in the sixties and seventies, well, many of them came out of Esalen, which is this Institute on the West coast of the United States there, they were hippies. They were new age people. They were coming out of all the revolutions of the 60s and 70s, the sexual revolution, the, you know, psychedelic revolution, all these things, um, which we owe, every, you know, the existence of this field, this, this subject to them. Um, that said, they are just very outdated and irrelevant. I mean, this is when you see these really cliched phrases, you know, you know, find your magic, realize your destiny, or like, you know, you find your true soul's purpose, this kind of corny, cliched language. In the 60s and 70s, that was very novel and innovative. <laughs> but people like our age, you know, or younger see that stuff, you know, the, the power of now, the, um, uh, what are some other examples, landmark, which I'm a big fan of, but you sit in these boring corporate seminar rooms, you know, and have just these these kind of transformational exercises as powerful as they are just the framing of it the way it's marketed the way it's delivered is completely outdated and i think we're seeing a new generation arising that is very different that is much more modern much more tech friendly uh much more actually much less suspicious of religion like the you know the 60s 70s people were explicitly anti-religion now we're sort of like ah it's okay <laughs> um and i think you and i are part of that you know, mm. the, the fact that we're here talking about personal growth in a, with very different language, very different framing than the, you know, um, Eckhart Tolls of the world. Uh, I think largely a, a big difference is personal growth now cannot be framed as personal growth. Mm. Like that, that was so saturated, semantically saturated that, that now it's marketed as fitness, right? You have CrossFit, you have SoulCycle, it's marketed as productivity, Right leverage you know unlock your potential it's marketed as creativity it's marketed as you know communication skills relationship skills it's packaged in a different way but then when you get on the inside it's all the same stuff it's empowerment agency facing your fears taking risks but you know the the kind of usual suspects hmm. that's kind of the the at the cultural level the shift that i see happening that's interesting. That I find myself thinking about that in terms of so I tend to look at almost everything through like a like like a media lens or like how how that how has changing media technology and changing media landscape affected. And again, when you say when I hear myself say media media landscape media technology, my, my own eyes are like, are oh, you talking about like what advertising? Like and no, I mean yes and no, but like you know, I, I one of my my favorite essay of all time was written in twenty eleven, and it's about. Uh, it, it was about the internet back in 2011 before smartphones were widespread. Mm -hmm. And it pointed out that in when Harry Potter came on the scene in 1997, the book, right? Uh, that was before smartphones and tablets were proliferated. And so it was completely normal for the wizards, people who use magic, to go to the library and take out spell books to learn spells from. And like when kids these days read the books or watch the movie, like it just seems so anachronistic because it was at the tail end of the previous media technology. And, you know, you look back and you ask, like, how did the, the Protestant Reformation happen, right? Like, like when pamphlets and the printing press were introduced, it rocked the world, right? Like, because you could now read stuff that wasn't made by, like, uh, just, you know, authoritarian, authorities from guilds and, and, and those things. And so when the media landscape changes, people's psychology changes, their emotional landscape changes, their, you get exposed to all kinds of things that you weren't exposed to before. And you, you know, even 
before smartphones when like blogging started taking off like it, we almost forget how revolutionary it was just to, just that some guy could just sit down and write a blog right like the early early fitness bloggers um quantified self folks right like uh just anybody who sat down to write stuff for the wider internet like yeah. they i i think we really underestimate how much that changed everything i mean you know you can talk about how that influenced politics how it influenced um language itself right and and how we relate to ourselves and each other and just the assumption that oh now anybody is is just such a casual assumption now that anybody from anywhere can just make stuff and put it on youtube put it on twitter put it on a blog and a, acquire power that way you know like like status and leverage and and you know you cultivate a scene of of other people who are similar and then you 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 grow out of that and i'm just from that i'm going back to what you're saying about uh the changing contexts the changing like you know so how like what what now feels outdated which was uh sitting in a conference room and stuff like that right like so th there were these older structures that they and those structures must have been revolutionary compared to what came before right yes. like yes like so like the uh the phrase yuppie for example right like it stands for young urban professional right and so yuppies were like in the 80s or whatever when somebody got into finance or somebody got it. and like now we can almost laugh at finance guys They're like why would you want to be a finance guy it's such a boring way to live your <laughs> life but like compared to the 20s and 30s and whatever like the fact that you could study a bunch of math or whatever, become a young young urban professional. Like the, the reason the phrase exists is because a bunch of young people were doing something that nobody had done before, which was really like bypass the social conventions of, yeah. oh, you got to slave away for decades in some industry to make a living. And then they were like, oh, no, you know, I'm just going to wear a suit and tie and then I'm going to go around getting deals or however you want to frame it. So I'm, I'm brushing over a bunch of broad strokes, but um yeah you know it's just it's very cool and i think taking a step back to understand how these patterns have have played out like uh it gives us the opportunity to see i mean we can't predict precisely how it's going to change in the next five years ten years and so on but we can be sure that it's not going to remain static right so nothing has ever remained static and it's getting less and less static so so forward so this, um, this book I'm, I'm reading, which I'm having the hardest time finding, a second brain fail, um, <laughs> traces the whole origin of this modern sort of secular religion era to Harry Potter. Huh. He's like, okay, Harry have... Potter was the birth of the new world order. <laughs> I, I see it. I can see it. Yeah, it makes sense. But now, now you have to... Is it called Sacred? Right? Not the, everyone wants to know now. Sacred. I, thought, I thought so, but when I searched that, it's nowhere to be found. How long will it take you to go and get the book? Oh, it's Maybe on my later. iPad right here. All right. Yeah, we will we will wait to be illuminated what this thing is. Is it strange rights? Somebody else may have been new to it. Tara Isabella Burton. New religions yes. for a godless. Oh, strange rights. Yes, it is. Aha. There we go. That's a beautiful cover. I know. Nice. Yeah, this is one of the most insightful. If you're interested in this this subject in general, it's one of the most because so few people can zoom out that far to go from like the early days of like you know uh, what's it called like uh, like revivalist religion, you know, in 1800s to in in the United States, all the way to Harry Potter <laughs> and right. GamerGate and like right. you know these very modern phenomenon. <laughs> Right. Even even reading about the states, I remember um, I was reading about the telegraph. Right when the telegraph, the telegraph, yeah, the when the telegraph was first um, invented, and then they laid the telegraph wire across the ocean from the US to the UK, and it was it was just so interesting. Like when when the senator or like whoever the the official then was trying to get funding for the telegraph he had to compete with other senators or congressmen or whatever who were trying to get funding for like experiments in alchemy and and uh, telepathy and it's just you just <laughs> sit back and be like whoa like in 1800s it, in, in that late 1800 era it just seemed like anything was possible you know so it's like it doesn't seem weird at all like what if you know the telegraph doesn't work but telepathy does you know at, at that point you just don't know yeah and yeah it's just uh it's so interesting to get a sense of how 
how cultural norms change and even you know again like in in our recent lifetime like even if like so you were talking about like um hustle culture kind of getting sucker punched in the gut but even aside from that like you know there was a techno optimism i think around 2007 ish like peak google i guess before like prism and and snowden and like there was that time where like oh it just seems like tech's gonna get better and better and everything's yeah. gonna be amazing and driverless cars and brain interfaces and then we it's so like oh, okay we were so yeah, we, was, we were so <laughs> oh wow it was so and that was and that was even even after 9 11 i think for a while like there was a so may, maybe i mean yeah so it's complex right so there's multiple factors kind of pushing and pulling but yeah it, it's it, it does feel like there was a big darkening of the sky. But you know, then if you read some history, because when, when I was working on my book, uh, Introspect, and I, I was very much being like, oh, you know, these are such gloomy times. And then I found this book by Rollo May, who was in 1950s. He wrote, he wrote a book called Man's Search for Himself, like riffing off of Man's Search for Meaning. And like, it's just reading his book and it's like, it's the 1950s and people are anxious about, one, is the world going to end from like nuclear winter? And like, there's this, there's this, quote from a child talking to the mom saying mom can we go somewhere where there's no sky just just said you know in response to like oh the 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 propaganda or the marketing or whatever that i don't know how you put this the messaging right that bombs are gonna fall from the sky and uh you know set everything on fire set the sky on fire right and people were that anxious and you know they had just witnessed world war one and world war two and it's like fascism is real and like millions of people have been murdered it's like Oh, like, and so, like in contrast to the earlier optimism, where I was reading, uh, what's his name, Herbert, but H. G. Wells. Right when H. G. Wells was a teenager, he was like, everything about the world is getting amazing. Every like, we are gonna learn every all knowledge is gonna come to our hands, and we're gonna figure out the proper way to organize human society. And like, for, they were having those discussions at lunch at school or whatever. Like, we're gonna figure out the perfect organization principle for humanity. And, you know, everything's just going to, we're going to be rational and enlightened and everything's going to be beautiful. And then yeah. World War One, World War Two, and then they're like, fuck, you know, what do we really know? You know, like what we, like how, how did we not see that coming and how did that kind of, and all of those things. And then it's, it's bleakness so and obvious. despair. In retrospect, it's so obvious. Of course, all this was going to happen this way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, so, so then now when I look at, what people are struggling with and these are real struggles as well right like oh there's a resurgence of like ethno nationalism and all these things and it's like uh it feels like things are getting dark but then you look if you read enough history and you see enough it's like yeah there are these big cycles and this is like the pendulum like you said right like it just it gets better it gets worse it gets better it gets worse and yeah i mean again to bring this back to topic I, I do feel it's relevant you know i feel like it's always it's always all the big broad things are the context in which we live our lives and then the questions become you know what does it mean to be improving your task management system for yourself which you, you want to do like while it feels like you know the world is going to shit in some ways right and actually yeah. what's, what's your answer to that if someone if someone comes along to uh, build a second brain thing and they're like you know I came here because of I want to feel more agency but to be honest I feel like shit <laughs> and yeah. uh, what, what would you say to that yeah yeah that's a that's a great um, so I think part of this like why why do you, you know individuals need to even worry about this stuff any, anyway it's like in the past we had re we were within multiple reality bubbles right there was like the reality bubble of the family protecting us from all sorts of uncertainty and change and decisions and all these things outside of that was like the bubble of the neighborhood and the, the the local community and then there was the company that you worked at and then there was your you know your national culture and your government we existed within all these kind of shells um i think balaji was saying this a few people have said it recently like a lot of what's like we feel like we live in apocalyptic times like there's never been this much change and uncertainty and chaos and risk in many ways, it's just like we're stepping outside of our reality bubbles. Now the right. individual directly feels the impacts of supply chain issues, directly feels the impact of climate change, directly feels, you know, price fluctuations in the oil market in Saudi Arabia. It's like it's always, the world has always been nothing but change. It's just now that we that we feel it. 
And so I think part of what we're talking about here that applies to individuals is like, if you're building anything, creating content, writing a book, building a business or a side gig, or really just trying to have a great career, you now have to be aware of these bigger sort of tides, these bigger trends and pendulum swings. I, I, I often notice this. I don't know if it's because I read, I read a lot of history, like sci-fi and history is like my main two things, but people tend to create things almost blind to the wider what's happening in the culture. Like people mm. like pr with productivity, I can see it the most clearly, you know, people diving in and, and writing pieces or creating courses or whatever, ignoring some of these shifts that we're seeing. And then they wonder why, why it doesn't work or why people aren't responding or why it's not catching on. It's because they, they just don't see like that they're, the pendulum is swinging this way and they're trying to go that way. You have to respond to your like academics and intellectuals speaking of, you know, uh, this this community are really good at this, right? right. Responding to you know, re let me react to the 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 publication of this piece. Let me peer review that article. Let me respond to the tr like they're very aware of their environment. Those of us that are more independent and on the internet, we think that we're not subject. We think there's no there's no cultural sort of uh, river or tide that we that mm. we are flowing within, but we we absolutely are, right. So like on, with building on, a second, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to give some examples, like with building a second brain, like why, mm -hmm. why is this? I mean, at least in my view, the time for this, it's mm. surfing the anti-achievement, the post-achievement tide, I think is one thing. Uh, but in a, in another way, I, I'm trying to like be early to what I think is going to be a resurgence of tech optimism. This book yeah. is deeply tech optimist mm -hmm. like in like mm -hmm. you should see like some of the the shows i'm going on the interviews i'm doing like it's really crazy how default negative like you, you've talked about this yeah. like the mainstream yeah. media is like tech is the the source of all of our problems these days right and right. i'm just like and, actually and yeah, yeah. The, the funny thing for that is how much that is colored by the relationship between media and tech which is like for casual civilians who don't really know what's going on like you don't know like the backstory you just it's like there was a time in like so if you go and I, I I did research for this at some point like in 2010 2011 ish like if you read anything written about Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg in like he was like a national hero kind of thing yeah. it's like you know, and then you know social media Facebook started, started eating like media ad revenue and all of that so like and and it's, it's sad you know I've heard real stories from people who like the newsrooms were like gutted you know like just they they advertising revenue is crashing through the floor and like they've seen their friends and colleagues get fired and it's like you know the the emotional quality of that thing is it is not really adequately represented anywhere that isn't a gotcha or like a you know but like it's it's, it's a lot of feelings yeah sorry i got excited i interrupted you you're saying yeah no tech tech is eating media for lunch mm -hmm. it's it's just absolutely eating it uh, so they're now competitors. So now you have yeah. to read all all mainstream media through the lens of they are writing about their direct competition who is mm -hmm. like exterminating them. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so I guess I guess so, just to bring this mm -hmm. back to like, okay, so how do you do this? How do you mm -hmm. essentially dev like systematically develop st like strategic awareness of your information, media, cultural surroundings? Well, that is also what this book is about. To me, that that is not easy. Like you have to read widely, not just deeply in your little silo, but you right. have to like right. go horizontal. You have to know what's happening in adjacent industries. You have to talk to human beings, take notes yeah. on what they say, see if right. you're noticing those trends in other places. So in a funny way, you can think, I, I used to have a slide on this at the end of my course. It was ultimately kind of too abstract and I cut it, but it's like, think of your second brain as, an information system for maintaining like strategic awareness beyond more reliably than your biological brain can manage. Ah, oh, strategic. No, and you and you say that I'm reminded of. Uh, I was reading something about. I think it was the Iraq War around like 2005, and the general, the Colonel McMaster. So he's he's a general, and I saw any. There's a colonel on the ground who's doing really well compared to the other colonels in the who were like you know they carve up the territories and whatever and it's like one of the jokes that the men had was that colonel mcmaster has his own um foreign policy 
as and and it's like because he dis, he kind of he's like a little almost like a king right like or, or like a, a overseer of the the region and it's like to achieve their military objectives in that time they had they could not you know, it, it was not like a shooting war, like World War One or two, where it's like trenches and just straightforward. You know, it's like they had to know what was going on. They had to earn the trust of the people and they had to find out. You know, the people might not want the terrorists, but they're afraid to speak up in case they get caught. And there's all that complexity. And yeah. so it's just this, I've really got the sense that uh, McMaster and his men, like they were dealing with an increased complexity that no military groups had to deal with like even 10 20 years ago yeah. and then like the parallels between that and how like you know like companies now need to, like if you're a startup founder or whatever like it used to be like oh you just work on your product and you just ship it and you just you know i know repeat and now it's like you have to be sensitive to like are you like you know like yeah like whether it's like wars going on or you know domestic politics or whatever like you have to like the workplace and broader life is also intertwined now. So yeah. like every CEO has to have a foreign policy in a sense, you know, you know, you know and, and it's just, uh, it's a lot. I think and, that's right. And each mm-hmm. person, you know, yeah. as, the, as the CEO of your company of one, your startup of one, which d- whether you work in a big traditional organization or a, you know, solo freelancer or anywhere, anywhere in between, you have to think about what is your long-term vision? What is your strategy? Who are your, you know, what is the ecosystem, the network that you act within? All these things that only, like you were saying, only CEOs and presidents in the past had to even consider these questions. Now, like, you know, your student graduating college, like, well, what do you think the strategic landscape is of your future career? I don't know. <laughs> Iris says uh, she works in gaming and the geopolitics, they have to navigate this unfathomable. Iris, do you want to share anything? <laughs> Sounds like a sure. great story. <laughs> well, um, I was just thinking how, you know, we publish our game everywhere around the, the globe. And sometimes we have to localize our content for each of the different regions. And something that offends, you know, Koreans is actually very popular in China is like absolutely like, no, we can't have that in, in Japan. And just like navigating the, the geopolitics of just the gaming content we put out is it, pretty wow. unfathomable. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Somebody else was saying something like, uh, so Disney has their own in-house or like their proxy. I mean, so it's not literally in-house because they subcontract it out, but it's basically Disney quote unquote, you know, it's like, and they have intelligence. Obviously if you're like a multi-billion dollar company and you're like, oh, should I reopen a Disneyland in some country? Like you want to know what the conditions in that country are going to be, whatever. And like their incentives are so well aligned that some people were joking that Disney's Intel officers must be better, like have a better sense of the next 10 years in geopolitics, or whatever, than like people at, in the FBI or CIA who aren't as, don't have as much of a financial incentive to get it right. And Seriously. it's just, yeah, I mean, it seems plausible. I don't know if it's a shit post, but it's, it seems kind of plausible. Like, you know, like it's just, it, I think one of the remarkable things again about like blogging or whatever is really just seeing how a bunch of nerds who are passionate about figuring stuff out can outperform like institutions which have, you know, the experts have whatever infighting, politics, complications, and like a bunch of people who just want to really get to the bottom of the thing and figure crazy stuff out. I, I think that maybe that's the root cause. The reason you need to develop strategic awareness, you should develop strategic awareness, is the leverage available to you, the power that you hold in your hands is deserving of such, you know, such deep reflection and understanding and strategy. I mean, one person, just, just look at the, the things that individuals can accomplish these days. You can shift the, you know, the, the direction of wars. You can, um, you can change, you know, you can impact the stock market. You can obviously change the lives of thousands, millions of people. I mean, it's just unfathomable power to hold in your hands. Yeah, and one of my one of my talking points is like the power and the, the technology and the options have moved ahead of our intuitions. So our yes. intuitions tend to lag behind, right? And my favorite anecdote that I always use is that um, you know the electric guitar was around for thirty years before Jimi Hendrix showed up, like twenty something years before Jimi Hendrix showed up and 
used it completely differently than everybody did before that. And it's not like the capability did not exist. It's just that until someone was born without the assumption that, oh, an electric guitar is just a regular guitar, but plugged in. Like, yeah. And similarly, social media has been around for like 20, 30 years, but our intuitions for how we use and manage social media is very much informed by traditional media, right? A lot of people's yes. aspiration on Instagram, Twitter, whatever, is they want to be a broadcast star, right? Which is, which yeah. is you know, because the prestige and all, you, you see like, oh, here's a famous singer or a famous actor and they have this huge audience and therefore that was worshipped or, or you know enjoyed or whatever and that's what I want but like if you reimagine it and be like oh I don't actually need millions of people to follow me I just need yeah. a thousand of the absolute best whether it's smartest or you know who like along whatever dimension you want to work with yeah. and like there's no there's no blueprint for that. There's no rule book. There's no history. Like we, we are kind of living it out right now. And you know, even yeah. like people on the inter-intellect and people on Twitter, like we are charting uncharted territory. And so it's probably underappreciated and undervalued. I mean, that's, that's my belief. So I'm, I beat this drum <laughs> regularly. I think so. I think you're, you're on the, much more than me on the forefront of like kind of innovating on what that working in public, learning in public in real time in these, you know, multi-threaded, very precisely documented in public ways. Um, I'm actually in many ways, not on the frontier. I'm like the, like on the, in the gold rush, the guy that's like right. back on the, in mm -hmm. the city with like this, mm -hmm. I really, I really think of myself sometimes as like an arms dealer for intellectuals. I'm just right. like, you come in and it's like that wall of just like tools and weapons. And I'm just like, what would you like? You know, like, <laughs> what can I, what can I equip you with? And then I kind of equip, equip people so that they go out on the frontier and really hash it out. Uh, right. I mean, in many ways, everything in this book is like 10 years old. You know, it's the ever known yeah. paradigm of a decade ago. It's like folders. I haven't, I don't even mention, I don't even touch on the last three to four years of like graph based, you know, note taking. Which is fine. You know, I was just telling, so I don't know if I've told you this, but I've told some of my friends that, uh, you know, so building a second brain, the book is obviously going to take off. Like it's, I've, you can see it in, in magazine, in news stores or whatever, uh, magazines, in bookstores, right? <laughs> and so it's going to reach a range of people who are way beyond our immediate so when I say our, I'm talking about like my Twitter nerd friends, II friends, like this, this cluster of people who are very online. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have, we underestimate amongst ourselves how much those of us who kind of grew up on the internet, blogs, you know, have, have our own language and our own worldview and all of that. And it just, yes. it's like water for us, right? We breathe it and we swim in it. And so it's just normal. But like this, the world is so big and we don't even perceive it because we don't interface with that many new people every single day. Yes. But your book is gonna your book is now in the books in the bookstores, right? And so people are gonna find it from way outside our clusters, and then they're gonna follow you on Twitter, for example. And then through you, they're gonna be exposed to the rest of us or those of us who are already following you. And so that's gonna be exciting because it's gonna I anticipate that it's gonna be like an injection of fresh blood, new, new faces, new people. And I've been telling people like uh, we need to prepare for that actually. So I'm not sure people are ready for, you know, when an idea becomes more popular and again, I'm like a historian, like an amateur historian of when things blow up, like, you know, mm -hmm. become very popular, like how yes. do people deal with that? And very often, not very well, you know, very often people are used to having some kind of underdog mindset or mentality, like, oh, I'm not very famous. I'm not very rich. I'm not very successful. Therefore, I can be angry and yell and whatever. And it's fine because I'm just a little guy. And then people are like, oh, this little guy seems to know his stuff. Let's make him rich and powerful and, and successful or whatever. And then like, you're no longer an underdog. And so you can't really do underdog shit anymore without getting called out on it people be like hey you have a large audience you should be more respectful more responsible and then they're like how dare you tell me what to do right and it, it, it's hard you know I, I think people don't appreciate like again like success isn't ubiquitous right so when someone succeeds and they struggle with that success it's a very lonely place to be because nobody else other people don't relate to that so which is why when you were saying you know about writing a blog post about the psychological toll of writing a book like I'm so here for this and I'm going to support it as much as I can. And like, I, I can give you like a hypothesis on why there isn't a lot of stuff that's already like that. And it's basically because people will 
people will socially react a bit negatively to it. Like there will be some people be like, oh, fuck this guy. You know, he's, he's got this book. He's whining about success, basically, right? Yeah. Like give it to me instead then. But then we do need people to talk about this openly and honestly, because if nobody talks about it, then every time anybody crosses the threshold, they get hit by a car, right? A, a metaphorical car. It's like a Lady Gaga tweet about like famous prison, right? Like it's a, it's a warning for whoever else is following in the path. It's not that she's, she's like, I don't think she hates her life entirely, but like, if, if you go if you go looking for the warnings that people leave like subtly here and like you you, you start to find it and where, where was i going with that whole thing <laughs> i was just i guess i was just trying to it, get what, a sense of sorry? what you said what you said about people discovering this world this is kind of one of my secret missions you mm-hmm. know even mm-hmm. beyond like building a following and you know right. being powerful and influential which i think is kind of a spectrum is like i, I have this blog post called uh, welcome to renaissance 2.0 where I talk mm-hmm. about this, but like when I think about the way that I approach the internet, it's like small little neighborhoods. And mm-hmm. I came onto the internet in a very specific small community, which was the post rationalist community. Mm-hmm. And it was a completely different experience than most people. It was warm, it was inviting, it was personal. I, I very quickly, partially because I was in San Francisco, met the people, you know, reading the same blogs in person. And so I found friendship, I found connection, I found all the support and the feedback that I needed to develop my work and to build my business. And then I talked to like people who are not very online. You know, I talked to my Mm -hmm. parents, my uh, non-techie friends. And it's like, this is what I write about in the post. If you don't know about these warm, inviting internet communities, civilization seems to be collapsing. Like people don't talk to each other. You don't know your neighbors. You like, I go weeks without talking to any stranger for any reason, right? Everything is transactional. Culture is now, you know, terrible. It's all just Marvel films. You know, no one has any good ideas. It, the intellect is gone. It, it's not, it's just all moving online. But, right. but like you said, our intuitions are lagging. We don't mm-hmm. like so, most people don't know that that's happened. And with building a second brain, it's more, it's framed as like productivity and creativity, but like you can't really build a second brain, I think, without somehow finding some of these little communities and rabbit holes, right? It's like, it's just going to happen through you intentionally cultivating your, the way that you consume content and trying to save and elevate like the parts that you, that you want to capture. Uh, so that's kind of like the secret backdoor goal that I have. <laughs> nice. I think it's, and it's playing out and we're seeing it play. I, th- I think I have read you mention it before and it's, it's totally a thing where you, when you write down and repeat what it is that you're going to say and do, and like, it just, it will happen. Like you just mm-hmm. persist. Mm-hmm. And yet, what you just said um, about the rabbit holes, I do find that, yeah, you know, one of my long-term curiosities is just studying historical scenes, like scenes meaning groups of people who were uncommonly productive. And it's just really, you know, it's very difficult for individuals to pursue excellence in any domain entirely by themselves without anybody else kind of to bounce ideas off of because, you know, like three years into writing your great novel or whatever, and like your family is yelling at you, why aren't you doing better? Like you need to be able to, to tell your spouse, no, no, there's, there's at least, it, it sounds crazy even to say that, oh, there's a guy at my pub called, um, you know, C.S. Lewis or J.R.R. Tolkien, and I'm writing this grand epic fantasy for him to read like that already sounds crazy but yeah. if you don't have that guy at the bar and you're writing for yourself like that's even more insane right so yeah. it's very very different that that, that kind of limits it to like 0.01 percent outlier kind of things and what scenes yeah. do and like you know inter intellect does and like just groups of friends and i always encourage people like get on your group chat with your homies right and and encourage each other to try doing stuff right and and kind of support each other's pushing the boundaries because if you're not careful about uh because social groups tend towards homeostasis in a constricting way like just you you stop each you try you're trying to protect each other from looking bad or doing stupid things and then it just over like it spirals into getting smaller and smaller whereas like if you can angle it the other way around then you can write books and do dramatic things and your friends are rooting for you and then that is i think that's the thing though is is you know, when I've talked about this before, people are like, well, how do I become part of this, this or that scene? Which mm-hmm. Facebook group do I have to join or Slack channel right. do I have to get onto? And you can, you can do that, but you have to contribute. That's yeah. the thing. There's a price yeah. of admission. 
Yes. You have to say something, comment something, offer yeah. something. Yeah. Like be be an active player, be a participant. Mm -hmm. Because the other thing with these scenes is they have a they each have their own now like spectators. It's right. like the classic, what is it like 10%? In any given one mm -hmm. of these little internet subcultures, right. there is like 10% of most that are participating in any way, and everyone right. else is watching. And yeah. that's that's another reason I wrote this book is like like the only way that I knew how to contribute to the post-rationalist community, which was full of the freaking most smartest people I'd ever met in my entire life. It was terrifying you know mm -hmm. so intimidating to to like even jump into the comments on a ribbon farm post there's like phds and ai researchers i'm just like this is crazy i had to prepare i had to I'd not just spout something off but like go take some notes study a subject write something and then say this is the best i can do you know it's it's not just it requires courage but more than it's not just the courage to just blurt stuff out it's the I don't know, the willingness, the intentionality to like offer something to the community that is actually contributing real value. Yeah, you have to do the prep and you have to do the reading, basically. Right? You have to w walk around the space, look for, and, and you can talk to, like, you, you can de-risk it by talking to people if you, if you can. Like, just ask them what's on their mind, what they're worrying about, what they, what they care about. But yeah, you know, like, I, I like how I think you pointed out that it's almost like people are looking for a membership of some kind or like an entry, like an access card to a gated community. But it's more like a scene is just a cluster of people in the general vicinity of each other just doing stuff. Yes. And you can just go into that vicinity and just start doing stuff. And if it's yeah. if if you are picking up on what the the vibe is, right? Or like just the, the general tone of whatever's happening, then you can likely contribute something that other people are into and then you just share it with people and that's how it, it spins. Yeah. Anna, do you yeah. have thoughts? I see Anna's here. Uh, I love this idea. And um, I actually had a conversation a couple of days ago with Dan Shipper, uh, the founder of, uh, of Every, who is an incredibly thoughtful, wonderful person. Uh, and we were comparing like theses we have about writing. Uh, and one of my theses is that every piece of writing is revenge. Um, and I often find when I'm stuck with writing, I don't want to take revenge on anybody. I mean, of course, I'm using this in a very stretchy way. Maybe you want to take revenge on an earlier idea you had and you've proven yourself wrong and you're like, I'm going to show it to Anna today. Or maybe it's like an old prof or your ex or your boss, or whoever it is. Like, I mean, it's such a good, I mean, you're writing something because you think that that thought, that idea, that formulation does not exist in the world and you feel competent in that moment of insanity that you should be the person to like put mm. that idea down on paper right so you're correcting something in the world it's the same when you are starting a new family you're starting a startup you're correcting something you're you're bringing something mm. into existence that it, that doesn't exist but you want it to exist and so I, I really believe in that kind of drive but I really love mm. also this idea of like small groups and I, I kind of count interintellect as a small group because it's a meta group that gives rise to you know many um smaller little factions like if you, if, if you do it right there will be just the right um you know uh balance between competition um and and cooperation right so you do want to kind of you know show off like stand up to the challenge but you also know that it's it's happening in a psychologically safe environment. Yeah. Because we all know that the public is not psychologically safe. Like Lady, the Lady Gaga quotes, like fame is a prison, <laughs> but also it's kind of a, a, a medieval prison where you're put up on a scaffold somewhere, you know, uh, in the middle of the, uh, the town square hanging there and everybody can see you and throw things at you. Yeah. Um, so having a semi-public space that is not your family, where of course everybody's biased about you, whether pro or con, right? Depending on, on, the, on your family um, or the public, which is incredibly unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, the magic happens in the semi-public space, mm -hmm. whether that's a religious community, an online community, an intellectual interest-based community. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in like the early, the like, last years of communism and then post-communist Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. And we had this, incredibly mistaken idea about language that you can have a private language and a public language. So at home you would say, wink, wink, the party is full of idiots. And then you would go outside in the world in kind of the Václav Havel nightmare with a zero common knowledge formation and pretend and play a role. 
Um, and what people forgot is that this is a this is an illusion. Mm. The outside lies and this honesty and this grace trickles back into your family. Wow. As the same way as you know, a difficult family life appears at a wider scale, because if you have a society where everybody has dysfunctional private lives, it's impossible to expect, I mean, it's, it's insane to expect for them to form a healthy civic life. Yeah. So my mission with Interinteract is to build the semi-public space where we can align the language, be ourselves, explore the nuances. It's not just private, public, black and white, right, left. All the good stuff happens in, in the middle. I couldn't agree more. Semi-public space. I've never heard it framed that way, but I think it's right. Commons, it's the in-between, yeah. the, that gray yeah. area. Neighborhood commons. You know, speaking of like civic life and like private <clears> life, like <throat> so when I was working on my book, Introspect, uh, one of the central frames that I came, that I kind of uh, converged on was this idea of the inner like authoritarian tyrant within the person's self, like you feeling that, you know, and, and so to understand that, like, um, and if, if you, because I, I was just curious of, to understand things like what is narcissism as, as not, not, not like the, the medical definition per se, Nothing but like, when, friends. yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. When, when people describe it socially in a way that, that makes sense. And, you know, it's like, it's so funny because it's the, the, the conventional frame phrasing is like, oh, you know, narcissists are full of themselves. They're so in love with themselves. And like, when you really sit down and analyze it, it's like, that's not really love, right? If you go with the love is patient, love is kind, love is understanding, you know, love is listening. And like narcissists are not, they don't love themselves that way. Like they love an image of themselves, right? And then who who loves images of themselves? It's authoritarian tyrants, right? If you see the Kim Jong, like the North Korean military parades with the literally like giant Instagram photos being paraded on the military convoy. And it's like, it's having this rigid control over yourself, your identity, how you are perceived, right? Like make, and like having order over chaos and just understanding where that comes from. So I did a bunch of reading, which is why I was reading Rollo May as well, like Man's Search for Himself. Like, like well, what is the root of tyranny? Where does it come from? You know, why even like Star Wars and, and MCU stuff, it's like, where why why does someone turn to the dark side, right? Like in, in that sense, right? It's always, you know, they, they lost something that they loved or they feel unsafe and insecure and like they need to control things or they are going to be destroyed in some way. And I found that the more I... It's like this, there's this feedback loop of sorts where the more I came to analyze my own life to understand the ways in which I tried to like bully myself into, oh, you have to finish all your work before you can have any fun or you have to, you know, get these results or else, blah, blah, blah. Like, and, that. and then you, you like really try and sit down and understand where that's coming from. And I find that it made me almost, I don't know if sympathetic is the right word, but it helped me understand like, oh, why does fascism and tyranny play out in wider and even in like in friend groups or whatever right not necessarily like politics at the grand scale but like just these these force it's like love and fear basically right like why does fear why is fear used as as a baton or cudgel to try and control things and yeah it's really like what Anna is saying about uh private life and public life like i i think i when I was reflecting on my own journey, I underestimated the degree to which the kindness of strangers, and I mean, I, I consider books and movies, like art and music to be the kindness of strangers, right? Which, which kind of helped me pull myself out of like a, a more cloistered, anxious, like, a, so like if my schedule is not, if I'm not doing things like I'm a, I'm a loser or I'm I'm being ungrateful or I'm being selfish or like whatever like that whole that whole frame right the whole way of thinking is is so it's like scarcity mindset you know so fearful and healing really I think comes from interacting with people who are not like that and I under I continue to underestimate like so my first boss i had a great first boss which is like a ridiculous privilege in life right so many people have shitty bosses i had like an angel for a boss he was just you know like a zen master slash guru slash coach who paid me and he just encouraged me to to you know like he would ask me questions like so if i didn't do something he'll ask me why i didn't do it and i would instinctively be like oh 
this is where I get punished, right? Like if my parent, if my mom asked me why I didn't do something, it's because she's going to yell at me for, mm-hmm. she did, she needs a performance of me being, oh, I'm so sorry, mom, I screwed up, whatever. Whereas, and my teachers as well, like my whole culture in my country is like, it's like that. It's like, you know, if you if you fucked up, you're to be punished. And so you internalize that voice and like just encountering someone who was curious to understand my behavior and was not interested in punishing me. I, I, did, I could not compute. I was like, huh? Like you, you're really interested? Like, I stopped being interested a long time ago, like why I'm like this. I just assume it's because I'm a fuck up. And he's like, oh, no, no, I, I just want to know. Like, why is it because you were sleeping late? Is it because what's going on? And like just that exposure to that curiosity was just so, ah, you know, like, I, so I, I feel like it was a, such a gift that I feel obliged to share that with as many other people as possible. Like in every interaction that I have with people, I'm like, it's possible. It's possible to, to let go of the tension in your body and like be curious about yourself, be curious about your friends. And yeah, Anna has a hand up. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, I love this. And I think, first of all, Maria and Eva, you are the mm. lights of this salon. I mean, something yes. this is beautiful. Uh, we need more babies at Inherent Excellence. Um, I think, okay, so I think that there's actually um a relationship. I mean, of course, there's a relationship between the development of tyranny and the non-existence of of, of semi-public spaces where people can align and 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 you know discuss their differences and, and, and learn from each other. Um, and here I count like, you know, the comment section of less wrong is a semi-public space, right? It's not going into the New York Times, but you will be chatting to very smart strangers about challenging things and you have to prep. Um, I was very, very inspired um, during our last salon, Tiago, you were talking about internalized and externalized order, basically, mm-hmm. and the sufferings uh, that come from trying to hold all of your discipline in yourself, mm-hmm. constantly, you know, uh, restricting, limiting, and kind of rigidifying yourself, versus, you know, creating a space in the world where you create the order and then you're free and weightless and you can walk in and out, you can bring other people to show them, you know. Um, and I, I love that. I, I recently went to a Tyler Cohen's um, uh, conversation with Daniel Gross and, and Tyler was talking about how he uses his floor in Virginia, uh, mm-hmm. like a screenwriter, you know, the screenwriters put the whole film as post-its on the wall, like agile, you know, people, their software. Um, so he uses the, the floor and, and he actually like walks between ideas. Um, and I think there is something distrustful in how tyrannies develop because you, you think that you have to hold in all of the discipline or you think like our group or people like us, we only, we know the good order of how things should be. And you don't trust society as like this flexible organism where you can outsource your, your ideas, your institutions, your, your problems. So, so to me, that's, uh, that's really interesting. And, and, and through that, basically, like through my act of creating an externalized order in my life, whether that's an online community, a public room, um, you know, a, a blog where I just like ramble on about my ideas, through outsourcing my discipline into the world and trusting it with maintaining it and growing it, I basically create a semi public space. So it's not just that, oh, there are semi public spaces and we have to like apply. Of course, like you want to apply and you want to contribute. But through just talking, talking semi-publicly, the act creates, like we, we create with words, with the logos. Interesting. It's like right. there's a, even within one person, there's a private space, your internal thoughts, public space, but then there's something, there's a semi-public space for the human psyche. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, this doesn't exist, right? Like this thing that we're doing now, this inter-intact salon, only exists because we are here right now from five continents and we talk. So through yeah. these words, we create this, we bring this into existence and this is a semi-public space. Um, yeah. And I love how like, basically the most important thing that needs to exist in the world, anybody can do for zero dollar. Yeah. And to me that's mind blowing, like life is amazing. Like you can literally sit yeah. down on a bench and just like build a semi-public space. And yeah. it makes people will not remember it not existing. You're like, yeah, of course, like Tiago is sitting on the bench in LA talking to people, of course. You know, you become an institution and people yeah. lose memory of what, what, what happened before. Yeah. You know, there's a, I had this moment where 
I was trying to figure out my framework and I, I was like, we were living in Mexico city and I had the classic posters on every, we had a, a extra bedroom. And I was like one of those conspiracy theorists, like late at night, like, Oh, is it this? No, no, no. And then like making a giant line and then like post-its and all these things. And I had like capture organize, and distill or different versions of those words. And I was like, but what is the last one? You know, what is, what is the finale? Is it, oh, it's execution, which is also E. Is it production? Is it sharing? Is it delivery? Is it finalization? And nothing was working. And then I realized expression, expression, which I, I had this personal experience with, with my, my condition, my pain condition. You know, I'm a very introverted person. I have very high tolerance for being alone. I thought I, you know, my, my social needs are, I feel like low on the spectrum of things. But when my, this pain and tension in my throat got to a point that I had trouble having a conversation. And I, I just, I had this, this very personal experience that I have to speak. It is a, it is a survival need. It's not like five levels up on Maslow's hierarchy, which I often have the sense, you know, people online, they think once I'm ready, once I have all the knowledge and all the insights and I've done all the things, then I will, I will say something, then I will find my voice, then I will take a stand for something. I just had this experience that 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 communication is a survival need for humans. Uh, it doesn't have to be the grandest theory in the world. It can just be what you had for breakfast, what happened at school today, what happened at work. And there's even, there's even research about how we can only really hold thoughts for longer than like seven seconds while, when we're talking. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Communication. Our life happens in communication. To be human is to be in communication. And we just happen to live at a time that communication can also move mountains, change the fate of nations. And it's free. Yeah. I started intern tech when I didn't have a voice for five weeks because I had COVID. I mean, intern tech had existed before, but the online community literally came to be because so many people wanted to hop on calls with me and I literally couldn't speak. And I was at home in Brussels, uh, sitting like I was rubbed in vapor rub with a thermometer in my mouth, two blankets on me shivering. Wow. And I was like, I, people want to talk to me. So let's build an online community. And this is how the first Slack for intern select uh, uh, came to be because I couldn't speak. So really, was, yeah, no. it's very similar for me. The, the reason I, I, I wasn't going to be a very online person that wasn't predestined. It was because I needed a way to communicate and connect with people without speech. Uh, it's also how I got into public speaking. I got into public speaking, which which is always terrifying and it still is terrifying because it was easier for me to stand on a stage because I had amplification. Uh, I had a microphone. It was easier to do that than to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation from, from the perspective of just my vocal capability. I was pushed and forced onto this path totally against my will. <laughs> Only introverts, I think from, only yeah. introverts run communities. Every community is run by an introvert. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you yeah. see the difficulty and the challenge, and you can actually help people overcome them themselves. Yeah. I think same, same. I think I got into music, like live music, because it was a way for me to be visible by my choice in a way. Like I could influence my presentation, but I didn't have to endure like one on one conversation like, I didn't feel ready for that when I was like 17 and yeah it's a, it's, it's interesting recurring and, and I, you know I think I did I used to call myself an extrovert when I like I it's it, I'm, I'm still processing what that even means for me but like it's it's you know like I, I was fine throughout COVID just sitting at home you know because I've seen I've seen friends who claim to be introverts were like dying anyway uh Maria what what what's on your mind what do you, you yeah, hi everyone. Um, Tiago, congratulations on your book. Thank you. And uh, I have a question. Like, I know you became a parent around the same time as I did. And I love how your tweeting style changed since then. Like, I remember a tweet about like not taking any advice from childless people over 35. <laughs> that was nice. And so, I got in trouble I, for that. I really got in trouble <laughs> for that. It's good trouble. It's good trouble. So yeah, I'd like you to expand on that, like how your ideas of like productivity and achievement, but also like what does it mean to live a good life and what does it mean for you to like 
feel accomplished, changed since you have a kid? Gosh, you you tell me. I have only <laughs> questions, no answers. Oh my gosh. It is oh gosh. Having kids. We have a second one on, on the way due in November. Wow, congratulations. Yes, yes. Um I don't know. It's it's really funny. I was gonna say this earlier with what you were saying, Anna, with the relationship to order. Um, I think a lot of a lot, a lot of ways that I think is due to growing up in American culture and Brazilian culture which are the two most opposite cultures. It is, it's like black and white. It's like yin and yang. It, it, in almost every dimension, they're just polar opposites. And I, I kind of cycle switch between those to like American culture, hyper-individualistic achievement, reputation, recognition. And I pursued that for the first 35 years of my life. Um, but then Latino culture, family is a religion. I mean, my mom is Brazilian. My dad is Filipino. Like family is just everything. The purpose practically of life is family. And so now I've sort of switched to the opposite of extreme and I'm trying to hold these. What does it mean to seek recognition and achievement and to also feel it within myself very viscerally that my entire purpose is my family? I really don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. It feels zero sum to me sometimes. Like I have to take away one to feed the other, which I, I know is anytime something feels zero sum, it's because it's you're approaching it from fear, from scarcity, and from the past. And so I'm I'm just honestly learning from a lot of parents these days, like how they are able to approach that dichotomy without a zero sum mindset. You have any do you have any advice for me? <laughs> Maria, please. <laughs> yeah, I wish I had. Yeah, like I just recently started this job at Inter Intellect a few weeks ago. And and yeah, it does feel zero sum a little bit. But also like at the same time, I feel like I can be a better mother to my baby girl just because I have some time away from her. You know, like for the previous few months, like I was with her like almost all of the time. And we get a little tired with each other. And yeah adult conversation <laughs> really helps me <laughs> appreciate these moments together much more like when, when there's variety like I, I appreciate the time spent with the baby so much more than when it's just like, just this all of the time mm -hmm. so yeah like I I'm going to have a lot of thoughts about this like as I get on board with, with this job and <laughs> I'll try to share it along the way but yeah, at this moment, I have much more questions than answers too. I, I really uh, hope you do. Have you noticed there's such a, a absence of thought leaders, content creators on this subject? They We have kids and then we disappear from the online advice sphere because we just don't have time <laughs> to create thought leadership right. pieces. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Even if people have a lot of thoughts on this, like they're just too busy to create. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Before we go to Ganesha's question, any any other parents in the in on the call? Have any thoughts? Uh, Sylvia. Yeah. Yes. Hi. I don't have any answers. Sorry, I have lots of ah. questions. <laughs> I have a four-year-old, and I was struggling with balance. I started a new job uh, when she was three months, so I I wow. put it, all my energy on this new job, new career, and on the baby because even if you don't put the energy, the baby takes the energy from you, so you have to <laughs> put it. And and I was really struggling to be both a good parent uh, and and a good person at work, a woman. I don't know. It, it we have so much pressure, uh, especially women. I think maybe it's a cliche, but I think we we do. And someone told me once that um, if you want your kid to be fine, you need to be fine yourself. It's like on a plane, put your mask on before putting the mask on your baby, which is extremely violent when you're a parent to hear that. At the beginning, when I took planes, it was like, well, yes, it's obvious. You save yourself and then you will be able to save your kid. Then you become a parent. You see your baby, you say, oh, I could never do that. And you have to. So do whatever feels good for you and don't feel that you're sacrificing something, but you're making a choice. It's not easy. <laughs> yeah. I'm still struggling with it, but those two approaches help me sometimes. 
Yeah. Must to think about. Uh, Ganesh, you want to ask a question? Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, before I do that, I just want to very quickly say uh, plus one uh, thumbs up to Maria uh, for having a cute baby. And uh, Anna, uh, I've just been following you online, uh, in the salon thing. I was very curious. I was not sure. Oh, it's paid, you know, some stupid thinking. And then today I said Visa and Tiago and you know, uh, and what Visa said, I just want, so Anna, first of all, so your energy and enthusiasm, I had to, you know, remove you from speaker view to gallery view because you were jumping out of the screen. <laughs> just kidding. But I uh, love this. Uh, glad that I chose to do that just this evening uh, when Visa said four hours to go or something. And I said, oh, oh let nice. me just take a look. And I said, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Visa, what you said uh, about confidence and books and all that. So I don't think growing up in India was as, uh, you know, high expectation discipline Singapore where I spent a few months uh, many years ago, uh, but it is still the middle class uh, mentality is always about achievement and nothing is good enough. Luckily, my parents were very encouraging, but uh, in general, you're surrounded by that kind of thing and marks and the education system and so on. So this whole thing was that you build confidence after you get confidence, after you achieve something or do something. And that something is a never ending idealistic goal. But, you know, uh, exposure to American books and movies or, or the self help and things like that, you realize that confidence itself is an ingredient to achieving better and what you can do. So uh, I have also, for the last few years, many years, tried to adopt very consciously this whole thing of just encouraging younger people. So I'm popular uncle to nephews, nieces, and younger colleagues, and so on. It's a very important thing. So it touched me very deeply. So just wanted to acknowledge Visa that it's fantastic. And I hope you yeah, get your million <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, people impacted. Sorry uh, for the long preamble. But uh, so Tiago, the question was, I, uh, what I wanted to ask was that uh, Already many bestseller lists, you know, I already bought and gifted five hard copy books as soon as it got released on India on the same day. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. Now I'm, my mind is constantly thinking, see, the thing about giving books also is not about just telling people you should read this book because you have to identify the kind of person who, who would appreciate or actually read and benefit from the book. So constantly yeah. I'm thinking, would this person be a candidate for me to gift this? So I, I expect <laughs> to buy a few more Peace, for awesome. sure. Awesome. Thank you. You're an evangelist. Already, yeah, of course. Uh, so you've been, uh, you know, already making bestseller lists and it's only going to get better. But uh, uh, you do seem to have some kind of apprehensions as well, right? Because you are in that game. You have to be on every podcast. You have to be on the interviews. You're on the news channels and whatnot. So uh, how scared are you? What, what are you thinking of? How is it going to change? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm trying to be. I'm trying to be in as many places as will have me. Uh, yeah, it's kind of just a, uh, it's like running for office. Reminds me of running for political office in many ways. You're trying to kind of, you're tr you have a message in theory. You have this one thing that you stand for, but you're also kind of trying to be all things to all people, or at least as many people as you can. You're trying to widen the appeal. You're trying to translate what you're doing to every little subgroup and niche you, you know, I possibly can. Um, but I really rely on, yeah, I mean, first of all, yeah, the, the, the launch has been incredible. Like already it's far exceeded my expectations. We really didn't know if this concept of a second brain was going to resonate at all, right? It's already done well. But at this point, it's kind of like to continue widening that appeal and to, and to draw more people into this community, this movement, this idea. We need people like you. We need evangelists and translators, right? I, I've basically reached most of the people I'm going to reach, or at least the kinds of people I'm going to reach. But I always think about, you know, I spent most of my 20s, uh, working in developing countries in microfinance or teaching English or in development. And I just always think about these people who, you know, are not speaking English, are in little schools, little towns, little villages, who like will only get exposure to an idea once it has reached total mainstream saturation, 
right? Every time I'm like, oh, I don't want to go on, you know, Goop and talk about how, you know, and 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 have a second brain show up next to, you know, energy crystals that you can buy and like different things. But that's it's all part of a grander cause, I I hope, of just saturating as much of we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna reach, I don't think, atomic habits or something or you know, something like at the at the total mainstream level, but I'm just trying to reach as many people as I can. And it's already taking on such different forms, which I love seeing. Some people read the book and they're like, oh yes, this makes completely complete sense for how to manage my gardening, you know, keep track of all my plants and in each one of their watering schedules and all these things. I'm like, I I've never thought of that, but great. So I I don't know. I just love seeing that translation and dissemination process. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, I think I, I'm so I'm totally with you on this. I, I think it's very exciting. And again, right, like it, this goes back into like media saturation and we are each in our bubbles and it feels like, oh, everyone I know already knows everything about this. And, but there's so much people that we don't know, right? And yeah, it's just it's wild to, to perceive. Um, Iris, do you want to ask your question to Tiago? Uh, sure. Sorry, just scrolling up. Um, so what makes you, or I guess the ideas in your book, tech optimist? Um, you talked about that before. And what do you think of the perspective that tech is just a tool? It's kind of like magic in the Harry Potter universe. I would say that's exactly my perspective. Yeah, like like you look at what books have been published. There's like Deep Work, Cal Newport. There's The Shallows. There is... Um, you know, Nir Eyal's book on addictive technology. We've been, we're coming out, I, I hope, of a cycle where it's like, like I said, black and white. Either tech is this futuristic, godlike thing, we should just embrace the overlords, or it is the evil cancer at the heart of society. That's black and white thinking. That's all or nothing, which tells me we're coming from fear, scarcity, and like the trauma of the past. Um, I would say I'm, I'm a moderate in many ways. Like technology can bring many incredible benefits. It can also completely fragment your attention and radicalize you into some completely cult-like thing. But it's not inherently one of those things. We we need the human element. You know, a second brain is a is a is a human machine hybrid. It's really in some ways transhumanist. The technology gives you the power, the leverage, the reach. The human gives you the values, the principles, the morals, and the ethics. Um, so like, it's funny, it's a moderate position, but that also means it's a subtle position. It's a nuanced position, which it, it's, it's so fun. Like I, I just posted a couple of days ago, my appearance on, on, uh, my local news station in LA. And it's so funny to see, like, I try to, I spend a few minutes kind of explaining that. And, and the news anchor goes, you could just tell, like, she's just not really listening. She's just like, well, those are some interesting ideas. And then she like makes a little joke. Like it's just like classic, like in that movie, don't uh, don't look up, right? She's just right. like, well, I never know where to where to put that note, but we'll talk about that next time. It's just like, oh, just make light of it. And I'm like, this is so funny. It is so funny that, like, I just took it as I have not yet figured out how to package it in a simple enough way. That's what that tells me. <laughs> hmm. That's actually a very interesting. Because I deal with that as well. And I think it's just, I mean, it's part of it is provocation, right? Like, how do you, because people have, it's a, even if you say it correctly, right? And, and every cliche has some powerful, life-stirring truth inside it that just gets, gets quoted in the dust of familiarity. Like, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, it's just um, until you encounter a thing that, some, whether it's heartbreak or, betrayal grief some very strong emotions or you know love or whatever and just suddenly the wisdom in some cliche becomes apparent and then you're like oh my god like this is what like ancient greek greek poets were trying to say and i read those poems i'm like oh yeah it makes sense and then you're like but only in your the depths of your despair or the heights of your you know euphoria that you're like suddenly oh it, it makes sense yeah. And so I want, you know, I, I, so I guess I'm, I'm, I wonder if, I mean, I think it's always good for artists, creators to never be 
satisfied and be like, oh yeah, I've, I've said what I have to say. I'm done. You know, <laughs> like that's, that's, you know, that's tricky, but you want to always be experimenting. But I also wouldn't be surprised if there are people who read your stuff. It, they nod along, like, ah, that makes sense. And then, but until they have a moment where they need it, it doesn't activate. And like our psychology is kind of, um, it's annoyingly, I mean, it's, it's, it's both good and bad, right? Like it's, it's, it's meant to save us time and effort and energy so that we don't have an existential crisis at every tweet that we read but mm. like one in a dozen or so tweets could change our life for the better but we just don't read it that way and so it's it's a tricky thing but yeah i don't have an answer for it anna your hands up got more thoughts yeah um i had a really interesting conversation last night with priya ghosh um friend of mine um i went to uh, i went to speak at this event i'm in new york city and i went to manhattan and, and spoke at this incredibly beautiful event uh of a new group called the Golden Door Society. Um, it's women builders, uh, people coming together, you know, from, from technology, lawyers, people running from Congress, like really, really incredible women. Um, and most of them had met on Twitter. Um, and we were just sitting there with this really strong personal experience of having a semi-public space change our lives drastically. I mean, Visa, you and I, we were invited to go to SF in April 2019. That was my first time in the US, right? I literally Same. walked in through immigration saying that I'm here to see my Twitter friends. And the guy was like, <laughs> you would have thought that he had heard everything. It was like, really? I was like, yeah, okay. So that's how I came into America. And, and that's what happened. And like my second meeting in SF was with who ended up being my first investor. And I studied intra-intellect and it completely changed my life. Today, I run an American company. I live in a completely different country from somewhere that I would have ever thought. Um, I have a completely different social network. I found what I want to do with my life. I think I kind of maximized my, my positive leverage um, in how I want to help people and what I would like for them to achieve, how I want to empower them. And that's just Twitter and people running around. And so we know that we are in this fringe movement that is growing and that is an intimate part of the personal experience, life experience of so many of us, that there is this magic on the internet where ideas and openness proliferate and where you connect. And it's not just like, oh, there are two alts arguing in a comment section. It's like people are getting married in inter-intellect and having babies and moving to other continents and, and, and quitting jobs and starting books and 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 changing careers or just choosing not to have a career whatsoever like, these are the most important things in your life where you live with whom and on what right and these online this this online togetherness changes people's lives and i feel like whilst we know it that there are now three generations whose lives have been drastically impacted positively by these things it's still a fringe movement like you don't read about it in the new york times you don't read about it in the atlantic you read about how it feels to the not extremely online people the world is falling apart it's incredibly polarized and those things are also true and i would imagine also maybe easier to to measure there's more data so you can kind of like project the order on these things more and i think where is my responsibility do i have a responsibility to work on making my fringe culture into mainstream culture I started this company with an, with an article called We're a Niche We Just Didn't Know. So I immediately defined it as a small thing. Um, and a lot of people then reached out to me saying, oh, thank you for writing this down. I showed it to my parents to explain what I'm doing with my life um, because finally there were words. But we know from like cultural history that all cultural movements start on the fringe and then enter into the mainstream after they have reached a critical mass. Yeah. So I'm wondering, do we want to reach a critical mass? Do we have... Do we have a, um, I love the don't look up uh, analogy. Do, do I have a, do I have an, a, a kind of obligation to figure out a way to explain to the Kate Blanchett character on mainstream television, what I'm doing with my life or, or we just trust the process. I don't know. I don't really have a, even a coherent question, let alone an answer. I uh, just want to kind of ask you guys what you think. I think I, I like, this. yeah, different, different people have different roles and you have to choose your role. You know, we were saying before, like participating in these internet subcultures, but all the examples we were using were like intellectual contributions, but that is only one very narrow kind of contribution. Like the, the, the scenes, the communities I'm a part of, you know, 
there's different, just like any group, any community. There's the people who go and make friends with strangers. There's the people who, you know, organize events and like corral people and herd the cats to, to getting there. There's the hosts, there's the facilitators, there's the prov provocateurs, there's the contrarians. You, the full cast of characters is needed, right? Um, it, it's kind of like I've chosen this very, this very particular role, which I really, I was kind of convinced to take by James Clear. James Clear was kind of a mentor to me in writing my book. You know, I had this call with him, I'll never forget, when I was first conceiving of the book. Uh, and at this time, this was like 2019, Atomic Habits was just starting to really take off into the stratosphere. And I was sort of discussing different ideas. I'm like, oh, I, I don't want to sell out. I don't, I don't want to go too mainstream. Like, this is really a precious idea. And I, I want to kind of protect it and kind of just like, just like maybe just slightly expand it to new people. And James was like, okay, well, you can, like, you can take two paths. You can impress a few, you know, niche internet bloggers, or you can introduce a new idea to the world. And I was just like, well, shit, <laughs> when you put it that starkly, right? Um, and so what, J what James did with habits and what I've, I'm trying to do with Second Brain is to be, it's like an ambassador from one country to another. It's an ambassador from internet niche land we are we have strange rights and customs and traditions uh to this old this big still actually i don't know if it's bigger anymore but this older country called normie land right where they have very different traditions and culture from us and it's just that's just one role that many of many you can play i love it i called myself an emissary yesterday i feel like i'm an emissary from this weird mm -hmm. A country in the future where we have had this thing figured out and there's culture peace and then sometimes we go back um like the terminator but good and we try to like tell about it <laughs> the terminator but good <laughs> yeah the, the initiator what's, what's the opposite the yeah i was just gonna say that opposite of terminating i am you prepared to be initiated <laughs> <laughs> the instigator into, yeah be. into some strange rituals and rights right yeah, and I just my, my answer to your question is like, uh, you know, I think for me personally, my driving force is I always remember what it was like to be seventeen to twenty. Uh, you know, I was the same kid that I am now. You know, I'm smart, interesting, but like no one gave a shit. You know, and and um, I know that there's definitely other kids like me out there right now, and so I I pretty much work backwards from those kids. Like my whole life is just. Every time I find one of those kids, and I can feel it, I can feel it when I talk to them, like they just have that. There's, there's some, I, I don't know how to express it, but like, you know, I, I like a lot of people, but when I meet one of me, one of us, right, I'll say you and Tiago both have it as well, and Maria as well. Like, I mean, I'm talking about the people that I know. So, those of you on the call that I haven't spoken with, maybe you're also like us and I don't know yet, but like, there are people that I know when we speak, it's like, oh, you get it. Like, you're on the path and it's like many many different paths right whatever the path is but like you're you're on the path and then it's like as long as i am so my my task is always to find the next kid and just find the next kid introduce them to the rest okay I'm, okay i'm done i'm gonna find the next kid and just I, I i don't know why that's my thing but you know I've, I've leaned into it i'm just always looking for the next kid and then some of those kids will look for more kids and then spiral spiral that's my thing mm -hmm. generational mood Anybody else who hasn't asked any questions while Tiago is still around? Like, so we have, I will be here for like uh, the full three hours. So we are like an hour 45 in, and I think Tiago probably has to leave soon. But so while we I'll still stay, have him. I'll stay another 15 minutes. All right. Awesome. One question. Uh, what do you should just write in a book uh, after James, all this time? Uh, sorry? Would you still suggest people write a book after all this is done and all you've gone through? Only if you have to. <laughs> Only if you have literally no other choice. <laughs> Wait, I missed the question. What was it? He said, if, if you had to what? Um, what, do you, what do you still suggest writing a book? Writing a book. Oh, right. Yeah. See, actually, my answer is the same thing. Like, you should only write a book if like, you know, so like I, I've been trying to try and compress my book into an essay and I've been struggling. I'm like, I was struggling with it for almost two months. I'm trying to make the book into an essay. And then I realized, well, if it could have been written as an essay in the first place, I would have written the essay, you know, like instead of the book, because why waste, why, why burden yourself with a book when, if it could be answered in an essay, right? So yeah, so same answer, like if you must. 
Uh, yeah. Dean? So I'll, I'll say one more thing. I have a post yeah. on my blog, The Four Pathways of Modern Book Publishing, which is basically just a summary. There, there's now four primary ways of publishing a book. So even if you decide I really want to do a book, I have the skills and the, I'm willing to put in the time to write a book. What I have to say is, will it be effectively communicated in a book? You decide on a book, you still have four pathways and probably dozens of sub pathways within each of those. I chose one of those four, which is traditional publishing. And within traditional publishing, I did sort of the, I was just telling my little group of future authors this, that every piece of advice I give you, I, I took a, just a maximalist approach to this like no limit on the time I was going to put in the money that was going to be spent. I, I just made the, I made the biggest bet that I could make that this book would change the trajectory of my, my career and my business. And I, I don't think necessarily most people should take that path unless they feel that same way. Uh, and so you got to choose the path is for you. I mean, visa, visa had a completely different experience with the pathway he yeah. took. Like you have to choose the right one for you. Yeah, I think I think it pro it might be partially a uh, uh, outcropping of like your personality. So like I'm very naturally prolific, and so my approach is write a lot on many many different fronts. So write like I can do like multiple threads a day on Twitter, and if no one cares, I don't doesn't matter. And then so you do like hundreds of threads casually. If if you can do it casually, that's what you should do. If I know some people who are like oh I need to plan my thread before I tweet it, I'm like don't like then don't then don't try to do what I'm doing because the reason my system works for me is that I can just write threads off the cuff. And then I do hundreds of threads. And I'm like oh, okay like some subset of these threads resonate with people. Okay, expand those into essays, and then some of those essays then compile them into a book, and then yeah. that that's the path I took. And I would probably go crazy talking to traditional publishers. So it really depends on your personality. You got to know yourself. Yeah. Uh, Dean, what's your question? Hi, thanks. Uh, I wanted to ask Tiago, um, we're talking here in general about being beyond self-improvement um, and having children isn't really traditionally on the spectrum of like self-improvement tools, but what, what was it like being uh, a father going through all these, like this journey of publishing and, and building your business and how how did your expectations of, of what that would mean differ from the reality of, of being a father and doing these other pursuits? Yeah, gosh. Yeah, it's totally not uh, typically thought of as, it's kind of the opposite. In, in, from my American lens, it's almost like when you have kids, you give up. Oh, you're having kids, you're giving up on some of your ambition, you're giving up on becoming everything that you could be, which is just one point of view. It's a very like, yeah, I mean, that's, it's not even the American, it's a particular kind of American point of view. But then there's the Brazilian point of view, which is just, that's where all just most meaning comes from. That's it, like, I, I'm kind of reversing my, my sort of perspective on it, where the purpose of the work is to serve my family is really how I'm starting to think of it. You know, I think of what what is Caillou, my son, going to going to think about? What is he going to learn? What is he going to be able to model seeing me reach for my dreams? Seeing me give my all to something? Seeing me find my voice, literally and figuratively? You know, when I look back at my dad, uh, I the things I took away were everything he did, almost nothing he said. It was all what he did that stuck with me. And so I can say a lot of stuff, but who it's like someone else said on the call, who I'm being, you know, how I'm living my life day to day is what he's actually taking away. Uh, it's just, it's just family and kids are just a much wider, more expansive, more infinite game, multidimensional kind of sphere than work. Like it just, it just is, at least for me, it's just, it's just more meaningful. And so my time and attention over time is, is kind of going in that direction, probably partially by choice, partially through, you know, just like built in, you know, impulses in my genes. But um, I kind of think of it like rebalancing my meaning portfolio until I got married and had a kid. Almost like most the great majority of the meaning in my life came from work. It's like 90%, 80%, which has certain advantages, right? That's what inspired me to give it everything I had, but it also has major, major downsides. This is how people have existential crises. This is how 
You know, when your company fails, you spiral in, into depression or worse uh, is when too much meaning, purpose, fulfillment, satisfaction comes from, you know, any particular source. You see the opposite too. Like uh, I, something I talk about with my wife a lot, when, when too much meaning comes from your family, you also see this failure mode, right? The kid grows up and leaves home and suddenly the parent or parents have no purpose. Like the kid was the entire purpose for existing. So I'm, I'm just trying to have a diversified meaning portfolio of various, you know, investments that are kind of balance, balancing each other, complementing each other, and just, you know, trying to live the best life that I can live. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Everything, this all sounds so cliche, right? It's like internet subculture stuff. I feel like there's all these juicy contrarian ideas. Everything that I say, this is why I, I have shared very little about being a parent, just a, you know, a few things on Twitter is like, I'm back to being a novice again, back to being a normie. I, I'm only discovering the basic, like, obvious things about parenting right now. So I don't know. I'm I'm a learner when it comes to this domain. When you when you mentioned that, uh, you know, you, you learn stuff from what your dad did and not what he said, I realized, yeah, like, I can't remember a single meaning, not meaningful, but like, you know, my dad said a bunch of stuff. I don't remember any of the things he said, but I remember <laughs> like, you know, so he's an entrepreneur. So like the, the two, like the good thing that I learned is, oh, you can do whatever the hell you want, charge money, you know, you don't have to have a boss or whatever. But like the negative version of that was like no work-life balance and you should be slightly stressed all the time for no reason. <laughs> like those, those are the two inheritances I've got from my dad. One is like, I'm free to do whatever I want. The other one is I'm a little bit stressed all the time. Mm -hmm. And neither of those things were and he never explicitly stated either of those things which is very it's just kind of a mind fuck to think about like he never he never actually sat me down and said anything about business ever he just demonstrated what it's like and i'm like yeah that's that's the shit yeah anyway um yeah. marshall any questions yeah um thank you and uh i guess this is probably a little bit more of a, a tactical question and I apologize, Tiago, this is probably in your book, which I've ordered, and these have started you. your book, and I think it's also probably in your book. Um, but how important do you think it is for organizing information when you're journaling? And I asked that either at the time or after the fact, and thinking about like maximizing the perspective you can provide yourself one year down the line, five years, 10 years. And I ask, because it comes from a place of feeling like I'm under-organizing and then the 10 years of journaling, which I've done um, and rarely go back to sometimes it's all for not. And I'm trying to kind of solve for that tension. Diego, you first. Yeah, you know, journaling, I was just, uh, the Q&A that we did for my book club a few days ago, I was saying that in some ways, journaling is the predecessor of the second brain. I mean, that's the closest analog, you know, writing your thoughts in an external notebook is, is where we come from. But paradoxically, I found over time, I used to very systematically during my weekly review, sit down with the, you know, the Evernote camera app, take a photo of each page, you know, which does like OCR. So everything becomes searchable, save them by date in the notebook, like in the folder in Evernote, all these things. But I think journaling is actually the one of the kinds of information consumption or creation that most or all of the values created in the moment. Like the purpose is just to get it out. I feel like it, I pretty much get the full like return on investment that I was looking for just by externalizing it. And over time, you know, I have, oh, I actually took it out because I was showing people, but here's my collection of journals. Right. And once in a while, I kind of take them off the shelf and look through them, but it's basically for nostalgic purposes, right? There, there is no, unlike say research or like reading nonfiction book or like, you know, like more hard factual things, which is what I keep in my, you know, digital notes. I don't really find the need to organize, you know, what I felt about my breakup in 2014. <laughs> So I'm the opposite of Tiago, actually. Like I'm, I'm very much, uh, and I think this again. This is partially your personality, and pass, partially what do you want to get out of your journaling. Like, so I'm, I also enjoy journaling in the moment, but I have very much this sense of my life is like this super project of of. So I care very much about what I felt about some specific. I said no breakups, but like you know, like 
um, I feel the impulse to periodically revisit my emotions from some event, like from my when I was a teenager, I want to revisit it at 20, revisit it at 30, at 50. And you know, it's a bit weird. I don't, I would not, I would not. Um, so like I, I recommend that people journal and I recommend glancing through a journals from time to time. But I don't recommend doing what I do, which is like be a neurotic kind of, I'm going to like chew it up and then chew it up again and reconstitute it and chew it. Like that's a, that's probably a slight, slight mental illness, I think, you know. Um, but it, it, I think it helps to produce, if you want to write novels. So like I'm, you know, I intend to write, so I haven't written, I've written one draft of a novel, but I intend to spend like my older years writing novels. So this, this it's kind of, in service of that you know if i didn't have that vision for myself of i'm gonna be revisiting and reviewing for some reason like i don't think i would do it for its own sake per se so like it matters to me in the process of writing my books that i have this like layered perspective of like what did 2022 visa think about what 2015 visa think about what 27 2007 visa said they, you don't need that you know it doesn't it doesn't really it's a specific kind of um, slightly perverse <laughs> pleasure um, and it's I, I would say for the common person who's asking the question right? so again if you're asking the question like some part of you must be expecting yeah. something or kind of hoping for something right so well, I, I would explore that like you still you should journal about that you should journal about why <laughs> you think you want you know um, there's this great riff from Alan Watts that took me a very long time to understand where he said if someone came to him and asked how do I be a better person? He wouldn't answer the question with answers. He would just respond with, oh, why? Like, why do you want to be a better person? You know, and like the conversation that follows, the person's like, oh, you know, because I'm so terrible. Like, uh, why do you think you're terrible? You know, it's like, he's, the, the person's looking for an answer, but, and he is, he, Alan wants to answer him, you know, help him resolve the pain that he's having or like the tension or whatever. But if you just give him an answer, oh, you know, um, do, do good deeds to other people and, and you know, like, then you'll be a better person. And then the person's like, yes, got it. But he's still carrying that neurotic tension of, oh, I'm so terrible and therefore I must do good deeds. And so every day I try and do good deeds, but I'm still terrible. Like, you know what I mean? It, like, to solve the problem, it requires like, a gentle inquiry, right? And here is everything I've said so far is me kind of preaching what I am, what I try to embody at my best, but on at my worst, I'm just this, a horrible guy just kind of like goleming with all my old thoughts and Facebook status. I said, like, hmm, what did Visa say 20 years ago? Maybe there's some clues in here about what. But, you know, um, yeah, that's my thing. Like, just, oh, just be gentle with yourself. I would say too, Marshall, I, this is kind of the thing I forgot to say about the American versus Brazilian culture, which you're reminding me. One, I think one of the most, the deepest assumptions in American culture is that order is inherently good. It's a deep, it's probably an assumption of all Western civilization. So we're always trying to add order to everything all the time, assuming it can only get better. I think of order more like salt. You can add salt to a dish, gets better, gets better, but then it starts to not get better and then it quickly gets worse, right? Um, and this is something Brazilian culture is the perfect embodiment of. I mean, Bra Brazil is just, you never know what's going to happen, you know, like just next minute there could be a banda you know basically like a parade outside your door they could be pulling you out and you could be like going with a, a bloco which is like a little carnival parade uh friends could drop by at any moment which they still do down there which is now you know now become rude and offensive and in the u.s just drop by anytime um and so play with order like try having 10 percent more order see if that feels like directionally correct if it doesn't try 10 percent less order like I see, I see people making the mistake of too much order, just at least as often as I see uh, not enough order, right? Whereas mm. usually people tend to just assume it's like a one-way scale of improvement. The more, like when I say order, I mean rules, I mean rigidity, I mean consistency, precision, um, all the comprehensiveness, all these things are more like a, you know, they have a, a, a peak and then they go down. So something to think about. Yeah, what? so I I tend I tend to be on team chaos somewhat like in the if we had to oversimplify, but like again, it's like um there is a tricky thing about when you so I want to say that 
if you feel like you're perfectly organized, like you're probably if you if you if your life feels perfectly orderly and perfectly organized, you've probably gone too far in some in some sense. It's like you know, it's like those it's all these quotes like if you're if you never miss a flight, you're going to the airport too early. I, I don't know if I agree with that because I you know my, my my airport's beautiful anyway, but um yeah you know like so my, my version of that was like um uh, as a teenager you know i used to want to be smart and i think smart people get things right and so i try to be right all the time and subconsciously you avoid difficult things because it's easy to be right all the time if you're only arguing with people who are you know like you seek out people who are easy to point out that they're making mistakes or they're wrong so you seek out like beginners right and you just dunk on beginners all the time and you don't get any smarter than that but you feel like you're because you're right all the time. And I feel like there's a parallel there where like there are things I could do to make my life feel like, oh, I'm perfectly organized. And that is by narrowing my scope of curiosity, being curious about fewer and fewer things, having less interests, less diverse friend groups, less like you just, you make your world smaller and it's automatically more organized, but is that what you want? You know, and that doesn't mean like you go all the way to the other extreme and there's like, a, I was reading a, Huxley's Doors of Perception. He was describing, you know, you take masculine and it talks about like just experiencing unfiltered perception, just infinite possibility, right? And like, you know, newborn children probably experience something like that, but like they struggle to get much done, right? So it's, yeah, it's like Tiago says, it's try 10% more, try 10% less, see how it feels and so on. Well, I think the Alan Watts question of why is really good. And I, I probably can't get to the actual truth, but I think if I were... Going a mm. little bit deeper, I would say it. I'm afraid of repeating myself over and over mm. again. I'm stuck in the same. Oh man, I can. Years. I can talk year. to you for an hours about that, man. I have yeah. so many <laughs> journal entries about repetition, and I have been on such a trip about repetition. It's like, ah, uh, man. It's you know there is there is the hollow repetition of addiction, like where it's like you're just you're doing it because of it's it's safe and you perceive it to be safe and familiar but you're actually avoiding stuff and then there is the repetition of reverence right which is like worship like when you when you're going over the details and the nuance of something and and appreciating it and i found that yeah worrying about repetition is a kind of spook it's a kind of trap in my experience right so when i was afraid of being repetitive i twisted myself into a tighter knot and pretzel and so what what kind of unraveled that for me was is the repetition here is it reverence or is it um, avoidance right and and trying to face avoidance when it's happening which is hard it's painful it's scary but that's where yeah visa i'm gonna i'm gonna have to take off but it was lovely being with you all such a stimulating conversation anna thank, thank you, you for so much for hanging out Diego. Thank you so much. This is amazing. I'm going to just watch the video on loop of this. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> my way of coping. Thanks, guys. Okay, Diego. I'll see you online. See you. So I'm still here for, I have like an hour on the clock. If anyone still wants to hang out, chat, ask questions, soapbox, we, we, we've got time to kill. So, Visa, I think this repetition, you said you have done tons of writing, thinking, but I, I don't mm -hmm. remember uh, reading uh, uh, anything you wrote about it so i was just wondering that this is something that uh i have faced where if you have already like tiago keeps going on these interviews now because he's written a book right so it's like mm -hmm. i won't listen to the fifth or sixth podcast unless i know that it's some the podcaster right. or the interviewer is different because i know what he's going to say now there are how mm -hmm. many ways can he talk about you know, right. Can you explain? They will say, "Can you explain basically what is a second way?" And then he has to, you know, so that kind yeah. of stuff. But he has yeah. to do it because that's that's he has to do that's it. True. Right? That's, that's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Now, so I was just thinking that uh, sometimes the repetition is not just either an avoidance or something uh, with reverence. Uh, you you talked about that. It's nice framing. But yeah. I was thinking of a different angle, which is like novelty seeking. So what happens is mm -hmm. I am bored with the way. I am saying this thing because I just told it a few times to a few other people. Right. So my mind, I have heard this. So I am bored. But you probably are listening to me say, uttering these statements or ideas for the first time and mm -hmm. all the people listening, all of you, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes I feel it is just my own weakness or, or craving for novelty that mm -hmm. to, in order that I don't get bored, 
I come out with a new to me way of saying it, which is not the best necessarily for this, this audience or the situation. So I'm doing a disservice. That means I'm not being kind to the listeners sure. and the audience. Mm. So yeah, I, I, I deal with this a lot and I would say that where I'm at with it right now is that, uh, you know, so there is some amount of repetition of material that is inescapable because you're just saying this, you know, you're, you're, you're being asked questions and the answers are in the same space. But I would say that um, the task for the speaker or for the, you know, whoever is in the seat, right? It, and this is how I approach it for myself. I always ask myself, um, so even if I'm about to give a talk on something that I have already given a dozen talks on, um, I try to, to have a good time myself by asking myself, how am I feeling today? And how am I feeling in this context? And what is surprising to me right now? Oh, and so, you know, I might have like a dozen talking points, maybe let's say like five or six things I talk about all the time. And there will be invariably there'll be something that is is um less uh, recently explored so i try to go to the, the bottom of my deck in a sense and i believe that so this is a belief on my part i don't know if it's how true it is but like i feel that when the speaker is genuinely engaged that it's worth you know kind of um sawing off some of the specifics and losing some specifics of the details. So maybe you have a very, very highly polished routine that does very, very well. But I like to go off script a little bit and, and try to seek out what feels resonant in the moment. And I think that when the audience feels that, usually that leads to a better outcome. I think that's usually true. It depends on the context. You know, I mean, if it's, if it's a very exciting context, like you are being, like normally you talk to local TV or whatever, and suddenly you get to go on international TV, then you get to recite your usual spiel, but you're excited because, whoa, there's a big audience now. Like I get to, you know, it, it feels fresh because it's bold. So yeah, I guess it's always about, you know, why are you doing this? Remind yourself of why you're doing it, who it's for and what, what's exciting about it. It, it. it is like emotional labor to some degree. Like you have to sit down and get yourself excited again. If So, I mean, it, it's up to you, right? You figure out what your mission is, um, why the book's important to you. And you, you might have to do some, you might have to carry some of the weight yourself. That's how I approach it. Yeah, yeah the one small thing I would like to hear you say, see, this is the problem. You, you tend to hang out with people or follow people whose ideas or beliefs are more in... In, in sync with what you do. So in my case, for example, everything that I have done is always without a script. Mm -hmm. So it's never a script, right? So you just have a few yeah. points, as you said. So anyway, yeah. it is new and anyway, it's spontaneous. And I, I justify it, rationalize it by saying the audience is different. It's a very sincere and authentic connect and so on. But I'm just uh, wondering if there are occasions where uh, the scripting is the best and all well, that's called for. Maybe I haven't put myself in that situation or faced it yet, but uh, I I mean, it's a kind of a, you know, humble brag to say I've winged it so far, but it's not winging, right? It's a lot of preparation yeah. or what. It's yeah. just that it's not scripted. It's it's like an aversion almost to, to have yeah. a, a script or say something exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's even, even like so improvisational musicians, they still have to practice, you know, they practice improvising. And so they have done the preparation. It's just that they're not, they don't go on stage knowing I'm going to play this, 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 this. They go, they, it's just that I have practice. So I know that when I'm on stage, I know my material. I know what I want to think about, what, where I want to go, how I want to, like you have these, these vague ideas and then you, you, you demonstrate in real time what it's, what it's about, right? Yeah, thanks. That, that analogy, I think, clicks. Improv. Yeah. Dean, did you have a thought? I was going to kind of take a left turn. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to yeah, ask you, my my wife and I are just like the last 12 pages or so of introspect. Uh, uh, we were reading it together. And so I wanted to ask you, um, did you did you have an outside editor for that process? Did you? So you were totally accountable on your own, like talking, taking on a big project like that. You talk about it in the book, like it's it's not just a project management thing. It's also like there's emotional backlash to delving into yeah. all this. Yeah. So in this salon about you know going beyond self improvement, like besides what you put in the book, now that you've had some distance, are there other reflections you have about like how you would have framed your self improvement or or your project management working on the book now that you have perspective? 
Hmm. What would I have like, like done differently or how would I re- revisit it? Uh, yeah, like how would, what would you have done differently? Or if you could talk to Visa two years ago or, or whatever and say like, hey, heads up, don't forget about this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 um, what I was not very disciplined about that I think cost me a bunch is I would very often kind of just dive right into my project and like so i'm just like i'm gonna work on my book today so i just open all my tabs and i just like this is a start you know and what i would guide younger visa or you know fresher visa, like, okay think of your work on your book right as think in think in sessions think in like you're gonna have you have maybe three to four hours of mental clarity at, at if you're lucky at best right you may like you know and you're not going to be able to read all reread all of your book in one sitting you're not going to be like you can only get like you can only lay a few bricks at a time basically right like so um take a few minutes even half an hour right to think about where what you want to be doing before you do it and then at the end of the session take like five minutes and write down a note of how you felt about that how, and you know i i so within the book, you can see that I do do it a little bit, like in the in between Act One and Act Two, I have that like those little notes. I would have done a lot more of that. I think I wish, I wish I had done more meta commentary of my writing while I was writing, and not not to, not necessarily to show off to other people to show off, not necessarily to surface it to other people, but just to to have more scaffolding for the work that I was doing. Because now that I look back, I feel like working on the book, I was really floundering. I was like, I had, and it's like emotionally challenging because the book's material itself like made me dig into my own trauma and stuff. But uh, I think even despite that, if it's just, if you're writing a 300 page book, uh, you need signposting, you need like chapter. Like, so I, I remember, I think at some point I was, replaying some video games to to unwind and i was just thinking wow it's so smart of uh so the uncharted the the naughty dog does this with their games and uh final fantasy 7 remake does this where they, they split the game into chapters i'm like it's so smart to split a game into chapters because then you can you can fix one chapter at a time right and if one cha- like you can you know it's just until you you think in chapters you don't realize that oh like if you're not thinking in chapters, it's just one huge sprawling mess. And yeah, it's mainly that. So it's, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of thematic. It's like, how am I feeling? Like, oh, I'm, I'm avoiding act three because, you know, I the, the section on, on desires feels kind of weak and I don't even know what I really think about that. Like those, those are the things I needed to, to do. So it's almost like introspecting while writing a book on introspection, but that's, that's what needed to be done. And I almost feel like, uh, I don't know. It'll it'll be interesting to work on my next project and see if I learned any lessons from my my previous experience. I think yes. I think I'm already thinking in projects more. Just as a it's like once you get lost, you're like, okay, I should retrace my steps when I'm traveling, right? I should remember the landmarks. I should remember um to bring a spare battery so that my phone doesn't run out. Like all these things you learn the hard way. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Iris, what's up? I had a question for, I guess, mm-hmm. the group. Um, since mm-hmm. we're talking here about self or, or beyond self-help, or, or what do you do beyond that? I'm curious if the group has started to explore uh, what that looks like for yourself, like what, what has resonated for you personally. I'm going to go and pee so you, you guys discuss it. Um, I think a big thing that I think about that is what self-help loses a lot of is when we're kind of with the five whys they're asking just like who are you who do you want to be that's a question that at the core of it is not really asked by a lot of people and you can't self-help your way out of it and that's the sort of thing i'm struggling a bit with right now of just like who do i want to be and why per se i'll I'll hop in um an idea i stole from from Ben Hardy, uh, he kind of talks about um, rather than like having a list of goals, figuring out to, to John or James's point, um, like who do you want to be like, and then figure out what are the, like what is the, the single accomplishment or single action that you could do that would 
by definition force you to be that. So um, a more concrete analogy for me, like when I first read that, I was this, um, I was working in my hometown as a musician, but I wanted to be touring on Broadway shows. And I didn't know how to, how to get in the game. I didn't know anyone who was doing it personally. And so um, a la Visa, I started to like just put out in the world like that was what I was interested in. And then like someone was like, hey, you should join this Facebook group. And eventually like that like brought me to an audition where I could like try to prove my, my, my skills. Uh, and so long story short, like eventually I got a chance to, to prove that I could work in that space. And then by, by becoming a touring musician, it addressed all my other fears of like, oh, I'm not a strong enough improviser or I, I don't groove well with a band. And so like getting that one job addressed all these other smaller like fears that I had that could have been projects on their own um, and then just took care of it all in one big blanket leap. So, um, oh, thank you gang. And yes, the, the reference was Benjamin Hardy. The book that I read was um, Personality Isn't Permanent, but I think he's had other more recent things that I, I haven't read though. Oh yeah, Gana, thank you for mentioning it. Maria? Yes, yeah, so I agree with uh, the question, like who do you wanna be, like being at the core of this beyond self-improvement thing. And this reminds me of like my old colleague and friend. And I, I was talking to him and saying like, I don't, I don't know what I want to do. Like, I know I don't want to do what I'm doing now, but like, I don't know what I, what else I could be doing. And I was like 25 at a time and he was like twice my age. And he just looked at me and said, well, like, why don't you just like try different things and see what works? <laughs> and you know, like, it was like the most obvious thing, but a large part of it is just like, knowing that you have options and what kind of options are out there. So like people like Visa who are just like nerdy about everything and like tweeting about like the, the history of something on one day. And yeah, like there are just like the world is so vast and there are just like so many options. And and first you need to like find out all the options, but then you like it's it's only like up to up to me to decide like what I like out of this. Like there's no self-help guru or or mentor who can decide that for me. So, so yeah, like it took me a while to realize like there are no right or wrong answers in here. And even if I make a choice, like there will, there will be no like exam at the end and no score telling me, yes, you did the right choice or you made the wrong choice. Like in the end, like it's, it's all how I feel about it. And where do I want to go? <laughs> Thank you for, for sharing that. No, um, no, I love all the answers. I think I've been struggling with, uh, in particular, um, going through healing my, you know, trauma, reading the book, The Body Keeps the Score. Uh, I highly recommend it if anyone here hasn't read that and realizing like, oh yeah, like who am I if I'm not defined by horrible things that have happened to me? And then once I've you know, gotten over that, or once I want to look beyond that and re or look back at, okay, so what do I actually like doing and how do I want to define myself or like, how, how do I want to be remembered by like when I eventually pass and like trying to answer those questions um, is actually kind of difficult because now I don't have, it's almost like a crutch, right? It's like, oh, I was defined by uh, stuff in my past and, and now I don't have that anymore like I can't use that anymore as my identity or or like uh, you know um, I think people were, were talking earlier about like you know I'm a woman or I'm this and like I'm this identity and you can like kind of clutch to that and and just make your whole life about that thing but eventually like you kind of have to move beyond that and so I, I'm sort of in that space right now like all right what do I do now <laughs> Yeah, in my experience, there is this like suspension in between, like you've unraveled some, some of the stuff and the new stuff hasn't emerged yet. So like you're suspended in, in I don't know, empty space and void. And it, it takes a while 
to like re-emerge from it on the other side. But but yeah, like I would say it's normal. We're, we're all going through this at, at our own pace. So yeah, this is normal experience and something will emerge eventually. I found, so speaking of like past, you know, interesting thing is I think often, often sometimes when we think about things that are small, we can switch into thinking about things that are big. And sometimes when you're thinking about things that are big, we can switch to thinking, thinking about things that are small. So like, uh, you know, like a smaller version of like the grand, how do I want to be remembered when I pass? It's like, I found myself thinking about like, you know, when I was working in my book, it was stressful, but it was so clarifying to just have one thing at the center of my life that that I was obsessing about every day. I mean, I, I did find that I was kind of annoyed that I, I feel like I wasn't very, I wasn't being very interesting outside of that, that thing. Like, so before I was working in my book, I was doing all these random threads about fun, crazy, chaotic stuff. And then when I was working on my book, I just didn't have the mental capacity or energy to go off on these nerd tangents. I was just like, oh, I'm trying to solve this book. And then when I was done with the book, I, I had time to decompress. And I was, I, a question I found myself asking was like, who am I when I don't have all this tension holding myself together, right? And it's, it's not, I'm not even thinking about like, like traumas or like grand like it's really literally just every day i'm working on my book and when i'm done i'm like oh now what <laughs> right and um the other the other thought experiment that i like about so one is like the I, I, find, I find funerals a bit grim so i think of like your 90th birthday and like it's a beautiful birthday what is it like who, who is there like who are you friends with that you're so proud to be friends with you know who are there kids are there blah 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 that's one way of thinking about it but the other but that can be a bit overwhelming like oh my god it's so much like i have to plan i have to think about my whole life and then it's also like just imagine you're having a, a really good day or a really good week or a really good month like just these kind of smaller things like what is a really really good day look like for you how would you spend it you know like and and how much, how much time would you spend with people? How much time would you spend doing something on your own? What would you be doing? And what is a very nice day like? And, you know, it's like, it's, uh, I think thinking about that made me think about things like, oh, I, I hardly think about food. But when I think about a lot of my favorite memories, food was involved. So I'm like, oh, okay, I should probably, you know, get better at cooking, you know, like invite friends over for dinner. Like those are just relative, like it takes a bit of effort. So if you're not, if you're going, if you're kind of living unconsciously, it just doesn't happen. But when you step back and you're like, hmm, like whenever I have a meal with friends and then we have, we like have a glass of wine or whatever, it's so nice. The conversation is so great. And I would definitely like a life with more of that rather than less of that. And then it just little things like that add up and yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I lost 10 minutes here, so sorry if I repeat myself, but um, I, I'm listening to you thinking about changing lives. I don't know. I know that I don't want to do this anymore, but I don't know <laughs> what I want to do. Uh, my experience, I'm, I'm struggling with something quite different now. I know what I want to do. I'm doing it now but I don't want it to do it the same way. I just experienced burnout like three months ago. It's a, a horrible experience. Uh, I, I thought I was losing my mind. I didn't recognize, recognize myself. I, 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 I thought that I would never be able to think <laughs> to make sense. And, and I'm going back to work in a month, not now, in a month. And I, I'm afraid to take the same path because I don't know how to do things differently. I'm passionate about what I do, but I know now that doing things uh, this passionately, with this passion, sorry, will lead me again to this horrible experience. So how do you change ways of doing things without changing the whole context? I don't know if I make sense. <laughs> it's uh, For me, it's easier when you change completely completely you know new job new new company new partner whatever things are different so it's easier to 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 pick up new habits i don't know if you guys have some ideas on that so I, I don't know if this sounds a little bit irresponsible but my my instinct listening to you speak is that i would trust you to figure it out you know it's like uh 
the fact that you are able to express that you're afraid of repeating the pattern to me it's a good, it's a good sign that you're probably gonna try not to but you know i acknowledge that it's it's possible it's always possible right it's always possible that you get swept up in the same loop somehow and then so so it's tricky but i just want to yeah. offer some, some reassurance yeah, because i've i've changed but my company hasn't you know <laughs> okay that's that's hard. they will yeah. be very careful and they, they've been extremely supportive but you know they will be very careful in the common uh, let's say three months and then they will be okay Sylvia yay you're you're good now yay. and I'm, I'm someone who's always smiling and and mostly happy even when I'm struggling you know I was hiding my my actual state to myself for a long time then when I called and I say well I think I'm not I'm not feeling very good my my colleagues were like whoa like you were always very motivating and asking for more work and and you were just drowning so this is my fear I've changed but my context and expectations haven't so okay yeah, Con yeah. context uh, context are very very hard like uh Tatiana do you have thoughts did I get that name right? Sorry? I'm yeah. just asking if Tatiana has thoughts. Yeah. I had, um, Sylvia, I deeply relate to that. I've been through, I think, multiple rounds of like the cycle of our burnout that you talk about. And it's exactly for that reason, because I like work and I like that I like what I do. And then you get to a point where you, you can't really do it anymore and then almost like recovery is just so that you can go back to the same cycle um i haven't solved this for myself but i'll just share um what i've done um, Please. <laughs> i it's all like very silly small things um i basically added um I made like my hobbies and the things that I feel like doing outside of work, like mandatory in my week. So once a week, I take myself on a field trip by myself. Um, I have like a list of things that I want to do in my city. And like on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, I'll just take a half a day and it's on my calendar and nothing can be scheduled over it. And um, like I've been to, to like a cat cafe to like pet kittens I've like gone to museums different neighborhoods that I had never been to and it really like doing it in the middle of the week has really mattered because it like resets like I feel like it gets worse and worse as the week goes on and doing it in the middle of the week and having some kind of reset in the middle has really been helpful um so that's like one specific silly thing that I try to do every week um I think more broadly, the way that work and anything fits into my life, like the way my brain approaches it is a little bit different now where I just kind of think that like nothing matters that much anymore. And I think when I was in those first cycles, I was like, I'm doing something so important. And this is like, if I'm not there, this is not gonna happen. And like, I have to do it. And like the world needs me. And now I'm like, I'm doing this because I like it and I don't need to do it. And in fact, when I don't show up, what, like, what do I enable by not being there? Like who, who can step up and need when I'm not in, in the room? And that really helps me to like, just let things fall. And just, because when, when that has happened and I have this attitude, then, things get figured out and everything kind of works out um so like trying to like actively cultivate this mindset of like maybe none of this matters that much um has, and like looking for things that make me think in that way yeah a colleague told me last last week we're not saving lives <laughs> and yeah yeah i'm not a surgeon so yeah i can let go yeah but i hear you i've, I've been there so yeah Mark. Thank you for your advice. Uh, Dean, your thoughts? Sylvia, I, I just wanted to say your, your positivity really radiates through across. And Thank so I'm, I'm happy to hear you're, you're 
coming back into uh, hopefully a more positive situation. As a, as a tactical consideration, one thing you might try, uh, in addition to all the wonderful things Tatiana was saying, is um, at, at the first opportunity for you, where like you're kind of at this crossroads of like, should I adopt what they expect of me or versus not, sometimes doing something uh, very out of character for what they would have expected from the old you is a way of establishing that things are going to be different moving forward. And maybe if you just do it once very firmly up front, that, hey, this thing that used to be okay is no longer okay, um, that, that that makes people pause and reconsider like, okay, maybe maybe she really means it. Maybe moving forward, uh, <laughs> this is just the new, yeah, this is a yeah. new moment. And so that can be hard a lot of times, like when it's the first and, and um, you have a whole history of doing things one way, but sometimes one really strong move in the opposite direction is enough to, to diffuse future situations. Yeah, you're right. This should be easy. I just have to say no once, <laughs> just once. Sometimes it's not that easy, but- No, it's not. Uh... <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Iris? Um, yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up. I, I also work in an industry where we run on passion. And so um, I think there's always a danger when you work in any sort of industry that runs on passion that people are very prone to burnout. One of the things I learned um, is that actually burnout has a different source for every individual. Um, it's very personal to the person experiencing it. Um, one of the things that resonated with me personally was um, burnout is usually a misalignment of your values and what the company is doing. And so sometimes taking stock of like, hey, are, are the, are, is, is the company's values like still aligned with mine? Sometimes getting that just um, better in alignment can, can just automatically like just revert the source of the burnout for you. Um, or it, it could be something else entirely. It could be like, you know, your day is set up in a way that is causing your brain to be like fragmented, like too much context switching um, is something that I've seen um, happen for a lot of people. So really understanding this sort, like taking a couple of days to understand the source of your own burnout and seeing like, is there anything within here that I can actually control for um, might, might help you like find your way out of this journey. But yeah, it, it's definitely a lifelong journey for me. I struggled with it. I, the first time I ever burnt out, I was a high school teacher. Um, and I very much struggled with, uh, I don't understand like how to be like psychologist, school counselor, like mom, best friend, and like everything to like 35 screaming children for, for five hours a day. Like it just like, it overwhelmed me so, so entirely. Um, but I still, at the end of the day, it's like, I still care, you know, and it, especially if it's like you're, you're especially working with in vocational it. jobs, like Yes, exactly. Yeah. Where where the job is to care for other human beings or to make the world a better place, like yeah. The, that. Yeah, I still immensely struggle with that. And now, even now, I'm like getting back into okay, how do I get involved into politics and like activism again? Like making very sure, like I'm gonna set limits to this thing. Like I'm doing this three times a week for one hour, and then I'm putting it down outside of that. So yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, for me, I don't think you have one reason not reason, but cause for burnout, I think is a combination of many, many things that are coming like very slowly. It's isolated, they're not dangerous, but once you put them together, it was motherhood, changing careers and working on an agency and, and, and something that Anna said at the beginning, your personal life and your public life, your, I, 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 don't, I don't think I know how to have both. I think I'm the same, wherever I go and, I don't have this protection. I don't know if you if you guys relate to that, but I, I don't know how to protect myself from everything because when you expose yourself as you are, you're fragile, you know, you're exposed. So I take things very, very personal. And well, I'm learning, I think. <laughs> you can still learn. Well, yeah. It was a horrible experience, but I think that positive things will come uh, out of that. Still don't recommend it, but yeah. <laughs> well, 
wanted to share, uh, probably uh, fair to say, uh, many people or maybe all are much younger, uh, but uh, it, it's a very uh, good move or a question to go from uh, earlier, there was a lot of discussion about, um, you know, who am I and who do I want to be? First of all, those two are kind of uh, uh, obviously different questions, but they, 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 at least to me, they take your mind uh, in different directions. So who am I tends to become about definitional. Can I convince somebody uh, and look at my past to mine some good things about myself or my accomplishments. It's a kind of a resume, who am I kind of thing to present myself. But who do I want to be is much more aspirational, visionary or visioning and what you want to be, you know, that kind of reflection journal, oh, I want to be something. Uh, but I, I would also say that uh, some of the things that we don't like about the 70s self-help, you can be anything, literature and that kind of thing. Uh, was about who do I want to be? I want to be Elon Musk. Who do I want to be? I want to be, I don't know if I, I sometimes, who do I want to be? I want to be Visa. Okay, just freely be prolific. It doesn't work. All the time Visa is telling that it may not work for you and this is my thing. My So uh, who do I want to be can also become a little oppressive if you misuse it or take a narrow definition. It's a good question. But I, uh, my, one of my favorite things is uh, all questions are not valuable for the answers that they lead to. Just stay with the questions, fall in love with questions. Of course, you will, you will try to get answers, but don't be obsessed with getting that the answer because there is no the answer. And to tell you personally, I, am, I will be 56 in a few weeks now. And this whole thing about who are you and what do you want to be and everything, I've just kind of uh, flowed through life with, I did engineering and then MBA, and then I went into software, which in India at that time, uh, in a narrow sense was very uh, unorthodox. So people said, you abandoned your engineering and then you went into management. You know, some people had this very thing about B school and MBA as a sellout, okay? And then after MBA going into software, they said, oh, you, you left your MBA. So I, I didn't feel that way, I just started my career in software was passionate and then after being in software as a developer and managing projects I kind of moved into coaching and training and came into HR and then people said you have abandoned your software you used to be good and it's like I'm not abandoning I'm just me right <laughs> so who knows what else I will be doing it's like I'm open yeah for a point in time to speak to somebody it's good to have these frames and this uh, identity, so to speak. But I think uh, one should not be oppressed by it. If, you, if you're uh, a little confused about who you want to be or who you are, I would say it's fine. The, and what Visa said is very important. If you're even able to say that it is a problem for you, that's a very good platform. It's good. Don't don't worry. Things will work out. And there'll be a lot of stuff. You came here. You, you're listening to weird different views from so many people, uh, things will, will <laughs> only get better. Yeah, just wanted to share that. Anna? Hi, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to reflect on what you mentioned, Sylvia. And I think it's, again, you know, I always think like, oh, everything is connected here. And there's a reason why people think about, they, they say, oh, I'm going to go on a tangent. And they're actually going into like a super logical direction that is, you know, the next level of thinking about a specific thing. Um, I don't know, it's, I mean, the private and public selves and the, the semi-private or semi-public space where you align them, to me, there's also a kind of mental health imperative there because it's actually almost impossible for a normal person in life to fully align their private and public selves. I think especially for women, it's the, the demands are extraordinarily different. And, and I think if you, you exist as a woman, especially if you're in a marriage, you have a kid, you know, the, the, the spaces in which you can create semi-public discussion that are not related to your childcare or your healthcare are almost, it's almost impossible. I mean, I see my, I don't have kids yet, but I see my closest friends, you know, raising small children and their lives are incredibly regimented. You know, they wake up, they meet the husband or their partner, 
um, they meet their kids, then they take the kids to school, like blah, blah, blah. and then you work, and then maybe you run to go to <laughs> yoga or something, and then you meet the cashier in the supermarket, and then you go home. And maybe like once a month, you go out with four girlfriends to have martinis. Uh, you're very, very rarely you know, expressing your kind of civic self. And I'm using civic in a very non-political way, just you're, you're a non-gendered, wonderful brain with all your thoughts and interests and the books and the music and the history that you love and the places you visited or want to visit. And that just can be celebrated or at least enjoyed without any agenda, any transactional or whatever goal. Um, and so I, I don't, I, I think like you will probably, if you ask yourself who I, who I am or who I want to be, you will probably come up with semi different answers for your private and the public. Because maybe you want to be, maybe you're a tough handed boss, but a gentle hearted mother, you know, or the other way around, like whatever, you know, whatever that is for you. Or, you know, like me, like you're kind of a hermit in your private life. And then you have this uber social like work life and people are like, oh, she's so social. Yeah, but like that's that half of my life. And then in order to not feel like split into two, which we shouldn't be, it's a relatively new invention that we have private lives in the first place. No wonder we're super unaccustomed. Like, what am I supposed to do? I'm, I only live with three people. That's weird. Like, I'm bored. Like, give me more people to talk to, you know? <laughs> like, you're, you're, you've been built to the children. <laughs> close a cage with a bunch of friends, right? Um, and so I, I do think that, you know, you probably won't find one answer to both questions uh, or both areas or spaces. But if you cultivate the liminal space between the two, you will at least understand where the, because like, I fully understand where the connection is between my private and my public self. Like Michael Nilsson says, everybody just has one idea their whole life. And through all your zigzags, you always ask the same question that's bugging you. And you will find that actually it's the same core inspiration that wrote your family life, your cohabitation, your solitude, whatever works for you in your private life into being. And it's the same thing on the other side of the same question that you're exploring in your, in your public self. And because it's all you, in my experience, it's, it, it really is coming together in this halfway between mm. them. Yeah. For now, I'm just asking questions, as Ganesh was saying. <laughs> Maybe we don't want it answered. What do we, if you answer the big questions of life, what do you have left to do? You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah, I want to entertain myself all my life. Yeah, I hope I still have <laughs> many years. No, but something that, uh, that you're saying is true, um, but is has become difficult with COVID is just to align or, or, or leave work at work and personal life uh, at home, you know, with COVID, especially people having children. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm bringing it up all over again, but my day was, like very military schedule you know with my husband I needed to work seven hours and to take care of my child half day because my husband needed to work and it and when I was with my daughter sometimes my telephone rang you know and you were looking at your phone um, am I missing something or thinking about the baby when you were at home and everything everything got mixed in in this process and I think that many people uh, never got to stop mixing things since COVID hit, you know? I totally understand. And there's a book that's, it's actually on the, when I started the online community for Interinteract, I created like a starter reading kit on five books. And one of the five books is, it's actually two books by um, a Japanese American psychotherapist who's now, I think like 90 years old, but still alive in California called Jean Shinoda Bolan. She's a Jungian psychologist. So all she talks about is archetypes. If you're not into those things, you want like this book, or maybe this will change your mind. I don't know. Um, and so what she's talking about basically is Greek mythology or generally like mythological frameworks in uh, why they came to be, why every you know, culture seems to have some sort of a mythology at some point in their development. Um, and she looks at basically the Olympian gods and says, oh, actually, people used to have Olympian gods because they represented areas of life. And so we all have all these different parts in ourselves. And it's really hard to understand how many different people inhabit one person. So they created like, you know, for a woman, there was like Artemis when you're young and like running around in the forest and chasing deer. And then, you know, Aphrodite when you want to- As we all do. 
yeah or Hera when you're when you're a wife or when you're giving birth like they would pray to a different goddess and so she wrote two books one is gods in every man for for man uh and and goddesses in every woman I mean it's both or, or all the genders should read both books um and she basically like guides you through the uh, the Olympian gods and goddesses to to facilitate or ease like make, make it less difficult for you to switch contexts and she actually like gives this example like the working mother and the variety of different people you have to be in one day and it's maddening but if you think about it like like Tiago was talking about like externalized order like you don't have to contain this cacophony of women in your own little body because you're just an individual they created a system that was external which was the mythology and they even had the little figurines in the house and the statues outside and you could actually go and talk to Hera and through that talk to the inner like wife archetype in you yeah and I was like sometimes I'm like you know I have like CEO and then that's one thing but even a CEO has like all these different roles like you are a different CEO to your team you're a different CEO to a journalist, you're a different CEO to an investor. And then you lead a community discussion, which is completely non-hierarchical and completely different. And people expect very different things from a, from a host. And then, I don't know, I go out to a course where I'm the newbie and I have no idea. Like, of course, nobody should turn to me for guidance, right, in that moment. Um, and I, it really helps me to understand or, or kind of like, remember that there are multiple ways to understand this and then there are potentially external things and i think we still use external systems like you know when you go to work out like you could technically work out in any stretchy cloth but you will you know you will choose your yoga pants whatever and there's something about like changing your clothes into something else the ritual that puts you you become a different person um, or you go out, you know, you're maybe you're with your your partner the whole day because you're working from home. But now you go out to a restaurant, and you could technically go into in the same clothes, but you're like, no, no, I'm putting on a dress or like a suit or whatever because I have to make this event a little bit sacred or different. Um, and so I think you know, all ritual is about separation, separating the sacred and the profane, and role transitioning from one role to the next one system of affiliation one hierarchy to the next is something that like tiago said like only kings and queens used to have to worry about this right like putting on ceremonial outfit and whatever and now every human being who lives especially in the west you have to worry about like contact switching at like a royal level um but i think there are ways to do it thanks I will buy another book now. <laughs> we should get like an Amazon gift card for these salons because sometimes I'm hosting and like people are talking and I'm like quietly ordering books on Amazon and it's just terrible. And you can you can tell when people are ordering books, there's a specific Zoom look that comes from sneakily ordering books whilst talking. Maria, my, Maria has already bought two, I'm sorry. We actually have an intern tag book fund. Guys, this is for real, this is not a joke um for people who can't afford like for especially if you're you're hosting a salon yourself and you have to buy books to prepare um or you are attending a salon where it's obligatory to get acquire book it's very rare um because a book club or something then we have financial help so uh let me know if if that's you Visa, should we wrap up? Uh, I have a question for me. Oh, I have a question, go. So kind of, uh, I don't know, personal question, you can say. So what is it, what is it that uh, you are uh, now uh, struggling with, grappling with? I'm not talking in terms of topics or I know you have a zillion topics and you anyway are very vocal at talking about it, but in terms of how you're doing things, what is bothering you? Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, in addition to all the positive, cheering and cheerful uh, persona that you have, positivity exuding, you, there's still something that you feel, oh, I wish I could do this better or whatever, something like that. What, what is it? I'm curious to know one or two things. Uh, 
For me or for Sorry, you? Sorry, you're on mute, Visa. <laughs> Okay. It's it's thanks for asking. Uh, it's pretty mundane, you know. It's like family stuff and and bills and uh, you know. So I I have this this persona which is real, you know. It's there's a part of me that's very much like this, um, rock star preacher persona that just wants to play with ideas and just wants to be that being. And that and that that guy doesn't want to doesn't care about my bills. He doesn't care about my, you know, anything like constraints. Like even project management. Like if 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 he could spend twenty years on a book, he would. And I have to be like, oh no, we can't do that. We, you know, we should we should have some project management. We should have some pipeline where we we ship stuff. We have bills to pay, stuff like that. And you know, I want to renovate my house. I wanna have kids with my wife potentially. And these are things that. Uh, you know, so I, when I say these things out loud, I'm like, the first phrase that comes to mind is that they complicate matters, right? <laughs> Which feels like an uncharitable thing to say. Like, uh, I mean, it's, it, it's, it, it's the complication of life, right? Like life wouldn't be interesting without constraints and without, so it's, it's you know, I, I know what are the things that I want to do, like grand scale, 50 years, 80 years, like I know what I'm going to be doing, but the day-to-day -day challenge of do I seek out consulting clients to pay the bills? And even then, like my consulting clients, like I help them with their stuff and they help other people and they are quite selected by my, you know, in their in my sphere. So it's it's it ends up being stuff that I want to do anyway. But you know, do I want to work on essays that I can do within a month or do I want to like so if I could do anything I'd be like oh I'll just I'll just work on an essay for five years you know or a book or whatever but like that does not seem like an option that is uh, available to me so I have to come up with all these compromises in between and uh, you know in my private personal self like in the shower I'm like grumpy about it i'm like oh, why do i have to do that you know why do i have to compromise this is life right this is being an adult being having having uh, not being born wealthy or whatever but like even like so sometimes you wish like, oh i wish i had a rich dad or someone who just pay for me to do whatever but would that actually be better you know because i do know people who are well off and they have their own set of struggles you know it's not like it's not like so the, the thing that i try to reflect on that is non-obvious and, and can seem kind of annoying is that you know, I think there's this there's this bit from uh, Hayao Miyazaki when he's working on his movie he's a filmmaker right he's an animator and he's like ah oh, this is terrible it's so frustrating it's so annoying and, and then he looks up and he's like but you know if these problems didn't exist I would not be happy like I, I these are this is the problem that I choose you know I, I want to I want to live out this problem, right? As opposed to, and yeah, I try to embody that. But I mean, the, the straight answer to your question is I'm just grumbly, grum, grumpy and grumbling about not already being, you know, financially independent enough that I can just do whatever. And I, I, I'm, I'm blink blessed. of an eye, blink of an eye, it's going to happen. And then still yeah. there'll be other things, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I force, and, and yeah, you know, I remember when I was uh, 17 or 18, and I was so upset and stressed that my future didn't seem like it was going anywhere that I, like, like, so I didn't know what I didn't give me, I didn't want to go to university. I didn't see any courses that I liked. And so I didn't know what my job prospects were. And uh, at 22, I got headhunted by a startup to based on my blog. And so I had no clue that that was possible, right? I mean, I, I was blogging because I knew that blog blogging is fun and there's opportunity and it's exciting and there's all these good things that can come out of it, but I didn't know specifically what was going to happen. So when I got my job at a local startup, um, it was amazing. I was like, wow, this is beyond my wildest dreams. I'm getting paid more than I thought I would ever get paid. And about six months in to my having a... It's not even my dream job. It's beyond my dream job. You know, my, my dream jobs were like one, two, three, four, five. And this is like a nine. And then about six months in, I remember uh, I was still smoking then. And I was like, I was just stressed out about some particular article that I was working on for my job. 
and I stepped out for a smoke and I just the thought entered my head ah, fuck I hate my life and then like this like like a a train size opposite thought smashed into me from another like how dare you how dare you even think that thought like oh my god like you're, li- you're literally living in what is comparatively paradise compared to what you were expecting four years ago three four years ago and already you have become you've taken for granted what a great opportunity you have and how it's beyond everything and you're upset about trivial thing like you're upset that you're you're upset that your perfect job is stressful <laughs> or it's, it's you're stressing yourself out trying to live up to your perfect job like that's what it felt like even us and you know now i can look back with the, with the decade more experience and, and have compassion for like every single guy in like every single thought in that stream like yes like you know i sh- i i was reminding myself to be grateful and also the struggle was real you know i felt I felt like I had something to prove and like, you know, it's almost like I had like survivor's guilt in a sense that my boss took a chance on me and not some other person who might be more deserving, right? And so I have to work hard to, to earn up for it. And, but that's, that became like a kind of straight jacket for me as well. It's, it's just an infinitely complex and beautiful. And you know, I really appreciate you asking me the question because I have, and this, this ties back to like Anna's points about um, public, comments and, and uh, semi-public spaces because inside my head these thoughts are not very pleasant you know it's not very charitable it's not very uh it's just ah oh, so frustrated why am I still doing but when I'm with friends right and I'm and talking to people it's it's not that I'm changing my thoughts for for other people but like being around other people makes it clearer to me how I want to present my thoughts right I don't want people to catch my anxieties and inherit them you know i don't want other people to inherit my brain worms like I, you can i'll show them to you like if, if i trust you like, i'll let you see them so that you know what i'm dealing with right so like earlier i was joking with someone that you know i get neurotic about going through my journals and stuff that's true you know and i, I can present it in an entertaining way but it's, it can also be kind of ugly and not as i mean again it's like it's, i don't want to get into like a comparison type, type thing like oh how ugly is my ugly is your ugly uglier than mine uh, yeah, maybe but nevertheless, um, being given the opportunity to share it with someone who's interested in hearing it, I think is is very it healed. It's very. I know. I feel the tension getting released from like this part of the chest for me when that happens. So thank you for the for the question, and thank you everyone else for listening to some guy rant about not being rich. But yeah, you get it. No, I think I I, I cannot tell you how much. Uh, it is like uh, it's not that your background or anything is directly relatable in the sense that you know where you have grown up or your background or what you went through, but the kinds of things that you talk about, it's like when I was younger, if uh, un unarticulated, inarticulate uh, certain thoughts about uh, you know hierarchy or you know breaking it or or uh, freedom or you know exploring and all that i didn't have the words or the vocabulary my reading had not expanded to even know that people have already thought or talked about these things uh, but you are able to say it which if at all i ever thought of or tried to discuss with close friends it would come out in a very silly childish way so it's like it's like uh, i can't even say why oh, i wish i had met you 20 years ago, because 20 years ago, you were just probably in school or some yeah, kid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So it's not that. It just it feels good that you have found a way to uh, approach whatever the way you're doing, right? Do 100 things and then talk to people. And then I've seen how people sometimes, you know, even in the Twitter, you take the trouble to, without sounding preachy or goody to shoes you still maintain that positivity which i think is a very high bar you may think it's natural for you or you work for it but it inspires so many others just like that just because you're answering right so it's 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 important that you know that and keep that in mind right i mean uh, so i just mentioned here uh, like many things in life it's like voluntary complexification like i remember when i got married among my friends group it was earlier i was one of the first so somebody would just ask you know just like a fun question to poke and ask hey why did you get married <laughs> it's like you know it's one of those voluntary complexification of life you just feel that you're ready to play at the next level of course it's never easy uh, but that's that's part of life i guess 
I remember that when you were talking about it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the detailed answer. Thank you so much, Ganesh. Well, it's been three hours, so I think this is a nice as any place to wrap up. Anyone got any final thoughts, things to share? Thank if you. Not, thank you for just, hosting. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, and thanks everyone. And I'll see you guys on Twitter. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. Bye. Everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. This was fantastic. <laughs>